School here in West Palm Beach, Florida, um, for the last stop on what has been a wonderful tour of trying to raise the issue of poverty higher on the American agenda, particularly in this presidential election year. More about that in case you're just tuning in. Let me start this conversation, though, first of all, by thanking the school district and by thanking specifically Franklin D. Roosevelt Middle School for having us here. Please thank the school for allowing us in for this conversation. And I've got a long list of folk I want to thank here, so let me get all their names out and then we can thank them for making this gathering possible. Of course, we want to thank our media partner, uh, WPBI-FM and WXEL-TV. Our community partners, of course, the Ivy Education Foundation, Zeta Tau Mega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Inc., the Youth Recreation Association, Communications by Johnson, Foster Construction, Searcy Denny, Scarcia Barnhart, and Shipley Attorneys at Law, and all of the local elected officials. Please thank all those persons. Please thank them all for making this gathering possible. This is, this is fascinating, Doc, because we, we've had a number of audiences across the country where we've talked to um, all ages uh, as we discuss this issue of poverty. And we're looking out now, since this is radio for some people and they can't actually see this, obviously, we're looking out at an audience now of hundreds of young people. Mm, precious um, young folk. Precious, young, precious young, people. young folk. And this really, you know, is fascinating as a place to close because it really does underscore what this conversation is really all about. Mm. This conversation about poverty is really about the future. It's about what kind of country we're going to have. And as we've said all along on this tour, the fastest group of Americans falling into poverty, or the group of Americans falling fastest into poverty, women and children. Women and children are falling faster into poverty in this country than anybody else. I want all the young people to listen to me on this. I want every young person to hear me on this one statistic. This just came out the other day. This statistic came out the other day. So the country that we live in, that we call home, the land of the free and the home of the brave, the United States of America, and we're all proud to live in America. But in this country tonight, tonight in America, 50 million people will go to bed hungry. 50 million people in our country tonight will go to bed not having had enough food to eat. Guess how many of that 50 million are children just like you, young people like you? Nine million. Hmm. 50 million people tonight go to bed without hmm. having enough to eat. Nine million of them are children. And that's what makes this conversation so meaningful. That's what makes the timing um, so significant. And that's why Dr. West and I have left he, of course, left the classroom uh, at Union uh, Theological Seminary in New York. I left my TV and radio studio in Los Angeles to get on the road together to try to beat the drum uh, about this issue. Um, it's one thing for one person to beat the drum, but if a second person starts beating the drum and a third person starts beating their drum, you get the point, a bunch of young folks start beating the drum about what's happening to them in this country, you can't have that many people beating the drum and somebody not hear the noise, right? So the more folk we can get to beat the drum about this issue across the nation, the sooner we can get elected officials and other leaders to pay closer attention and to make the eradication of poverty in our nation a real priority. I'm also looking at a room full of young people who are mostly African American. So it's not just that the agriculture department told us that nine million of you go to bed hungry every night in this nation. We also learned just this week that poverty in the rest of the country has not, has not gotten that much worse since 2010. Now, we're talking right over 15%, right over just over 15% of the nation um, uh, is in poverty. That, that's a bad enough number um, to begin with. Um, but uh, when the numbers came out this week, we discovered that the one community, the one community where poverty has gone up over the last couple of years. Anybody want to guess? You got it, young people. The black community. So in places like West Palm Beach, in places where I live, in Crenshaw, in South Central. Y'all heard of South Central LA? That's where I live. I live in South Central. So I live in a community like this. My, my office is in a community like this. So in places like South Central, in places like uh, West Palm Beach, in places where Dr. West hangs out in New York, like Harlem, where there are concentrated numbers of black folk, poverty over the last couple of years has gotten worse in our community. We are the one community where it has gone up. 
And so I want to say up front that we're here today, and I'll let Doc have his own say, then we're going to bring Brother Elvin in this conversation. But I want to say up front that we are not here today to push any political agenda. We are not here today to take sides. We are not here to advance a particular person, a, polit a, a particular orthodoxy. What we are here today is to talk about the truth, to talk about the facts, to talk about what is happening in our country, and particularly how it's impacting communities like West Palm Beach. Now, I'm not from Florida, but I've got a lot of friends who live here in West Palm, and I've been to Florida a thousand times in my life, and I've been to West Palm a whole bunch of times. I've got some friends that some of you know, some of the older folk in this room know some of my longtime friends. Uh, the Coleman family, I know the entire Coleman family, Coleman Funeral, I've been knowing them for 25 years. Uh, the Kinsey family, I know Bernard and Shirley from West Palm, Bernard is from here, they're my neighbors in L.A. So I know a lot about West Palm, and I've been here a number of times, and I've known Elvin for years, and he, of course, is from West Palm. So I know, I know this community, and I know the distinct difference between what it means to live and work in West Palm and what it means to live and work in Palm Beach. I, I get that distinction. And in a very real way, although it may be impolitic to say, that's a pretty good metaphor for what's happening in our country. What these numbers proved the other day is that the folk who are rich are getting richer. And the folk who are poor are getting what? Poor. poor. That's what's happening in America. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poor. So that's not about, let me be frank about this, that's not about Barack Obama. It's not about Mitt Romney. It's about the American people. Listen to this. One out of two Americans is either in or near poverty. There are 300 million people in this country. So for all you students who are bright at math, here's a math question for you. If there are 300 million Americans and one out of two of us is in poverty, how many people is in poverty in America? Huh? You got it, 150 million. There are 300 million Americans. One out of two of us, that means half of us are in poverty. In or so, near. In or near. Mm -hmm. So if there are 300 million Americans and one out of two of us is either in or near poverty, that means you're in poverty or you're low income, which means you're a paycheck or two away. So 150 million are in or near poverty. That's a serious issue. That's not a black thing or a white thing. It's not a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. This is an American catastrophe that we have to address. And that's why we came to a place like West Palm, because all across the nation, the numbers are indicating that poverty is growing in this country, and it is particularly hitting women and children like you hardest, and it's especially hitting communities of color hardest. So anybody that doesn't get that, or who thinks that Dr. West and I are playing politics with it, doesn't understand what our motivations are. More importantly, we accepted this invitation by the Ivy Educational Foundation. We came here because we celebrate the work they have done now for 10 years. Let's give them some love. 10 years, a decade. A decade of doing this kind of work. That's a long time, Doc, to be putting this kind of energy and effort yeah, in to make these young people a priority. And so there's a clear link between education and poverty in this country. There's a very distinct link between education and poverty. And so, you know, the better you are educated, the more likely it is that you're going to do better in life. That's what it has typically been. Nowadays, the data is even questionable about that. Just because you have a couple of degrees doesn't mean you're going to be well off anymore. Look at all these folk who've been laid off, who have degrees, who worked for years. So America is, is the, 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 there's, there's a paradigm shift happening in America. And we have to build a new construct. So we didn't come to West Palm today to play politics. We came here to talk about the truth. Does that make sense? Dr. Absolutely. Indeed, indeed. And especially young folk, I want to say this is directly to you. I want to look in your eyes and see your sparkle. And you know your eyes are the windows of your soul. Is that right? And I want you all to know that you come from a great people. Say that. Say that. We come from a great people. Come from a great people. And what I mean is, there's the people who respect themselves. When you respect yourself, you have confidence in yourself. How many young folk have confidence in themselves? Raise your hand. You got confidence in yourself. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to deal with any circumstance. And you're able to keep keeping on the way Curtis Mayfield used to say. Y'all know who Curtis Mayfield is? 
Go home and listen to some Curtis Mayfield tonight. <laughs> keep, keep it on. What is the Negro National Anthem, young people? What's the name of it? Somebody shout it out. Yes. Lift every. Yes. Now that means lift every voice. It doesn't mean lift every echo. I don't want young people to be an echo. You know what an echo is? It's like Br Brother Travis and I, when we go into the studio with Jay-Z and Lupe Fiasco and Erica Badu from Dallas. And we say we're part of a great tradition, but we see too many echoes among young people. We don't see enough originals. We see too many copies. What does that mean to see too many copies? Young folk wanting to act like everybody else in order to be accepted rather than to respect yourself, have confidence in yourself, think for yourself, and therefore move toward the sky. That's what the AKA sisters are about. They love you so that they want you to lift your voice, not your echo. And be an original, not a copy. Is that right, AKA sisters? Is that right? Are we telling the truth? And my mama's an AKA because you know how high quality AKA got to be. <laughs> <laughs> what you talking about? They got an elementary school named after my mama. Irene B. West Elementary School. Because she was a teacher and she cared for young people. And she cared for her children. So that's the starting point. That's what this tour is all about. And Brother Elvin, we're so glad to have you. Thank you, sir. Indeed, I know we go backwards. The Urban League, Chief of Staff, yes. visionary leader there, and you, you grew up here. I, I did. Uh, for those who may not know me, my name is Elvin Dowling, and I am a product of Roosevelt Junior High School. I graduated from this junior high school 25 years ago, uh, went on to Palm Beach Lakes High School, and then... <laughs> For those who are out there, that, that football stadium that you all play at, uh, every football game I had the privilege of uh, helping to build as student body president 20 years ago, and then I went on to Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia, yes, before yes. going on to the Earth. So you student body president in your high school, I student, didn't go to Hampton? Yes, sir. I was uh, class president starting at Westwood Elementary in the fourth grade. Wow. Oh, we got wow. some folks. Oh, I see. And uh -huh. was president every year from fourth grade through my junior year of college. Is that right? Yes, sir. What was, what was life? We're talking about poverty now, uh, Elvin. And one of the things, um, I should, I just, it just occurred to me with, with the AKs sponsoring this event today that I'm sitting between two alphas. Yes, indeed. I feel, I feel 06, 06, 06. I, I feel, sam as a Kappa man, I feel sandwiched in here today. <laughs> I feel boxed in with these apples on either side of me. Um, but very quickly, the thing that, about poverty that is so um, disturbing for us is that when you go back 50 years ago, um, in this community or any other community in the country, poverty was run amok then. Um, what's the, it's a, you've recently moved back here to, to Florida after being in New York for all those years as the chief of staff for the National Urban League. Um, so you served in a national organization honorably for all those years and decided to come back home with your wife and your, and your two kids back to Florida, back home. But as you, as you move around where you grew up, and you just gave us a wonderful history of what you experienced in this, in this town in terms of education, what are the distinct differences or what, what do you see that, dis that disturbs you um, from what you saw growing up here 25 years ago and what you see coming back here 25 years later, where, where poverty and related issues are concerned. Certainly. Uh, here at Roosevelt, uh, we, we read a story many years ago called A Tale of Two Cities. And it starts out by saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the season of light. Palm Beach County in general and West Palm Beach in particular is like a tale of two cities. Uh, there is extreme wealth on one end and extreme poverty yeah, yeah, on the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. The challenge that I've had over the past 20 plus years being gone and often visiting and coming back home and now being a permanent resident of West Palm Beach is that I realize that very little has changed since I left 20 years ago. And something at some point has to give. 
At what point do we as an African American community, when we look at neighborhoods like Pleasant City, when we look at Australian Avenue, when we look at 15th Street right behind us, and very little has changed, we have to begin asking ourselves the fundamental question, what are we doing wrong or what are we not doing? And I think part of that has to be holding our elected leaders accountable uh, for making sure that we have economic development in our communities. I've had an opportunity to go to your office uh, in Crenshaw and I realize what can happen when you take an old nightclub, for example, like yours and turn it into a center for economic development. We can do that right here in West Palm Beach, but it takes political will, it takes courage, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, Tavis, we haven't had very much of that uh, since the days of Maud Ford Lee and Alcee Hastings and, and those stalwart fighters in the community who often said no one can save us for us but us if it is to be it's up to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're talking about leadership which is lacking unfortunately dr west leadership is critically important to anything that we do yes. and when we don't have leadership leaders who are willing to stand up and say who gives a damn about political party who cares about what fraternity, sorority you're in, this is about helping people to step into their greatness. Until we're willing to do that, we're going to continue to be in this same rut that we're in. His name is Elvin Dowling. He grew up here. Brother Elvin. He's Brother a motivational Elvin. speaker, an author, entrepreneur, the architect of change. Elvin, good to have you here. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Pat. We're going to take a short break, about a minute, and reset the stage, and we are going to come back and continue our conversation. We are in West Palm Beach, Florida. This is the final stop on our poverty tour, having gone to four states on this tour. Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And this conversation is being brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. Yeah. You, you can drop it in though. There's nothing, live, not, there's nothing live today, though. You can drop it in later, yeah. Oh, oh that's to the next Yeah. So Jay's trying to do too much. He needs somebody to help him with this. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Let's give the band some love. The Roosevelt Middle School Marching Band, because we are now sitting inside of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Middle School, 
in West Palm Beach, Florida. In case you've just tuned in, this is the last stop on what has been a four-state poverty tour. We started in Ohio, then went to Virginia, then to Pennsylvania, and now in Florida, the last of four cities. Obviously, these are all swing states, battleground states, critically important in this upcoming presidential election. I'm Tavis Smiley. I'm Cornell West. And we're delighted to have you listening to this uh, conversation about how to make poverty a priority in this country. Pleased to be joined now by three persons who are all leaders in their own right. Let me introduce them, uh, given how they are seated next to me. Uh, first of all, please welcome State Representative Mark S. Pafford, representing West Palm Beach. Please welcome State Representative Pafford. Thank you. Next to him sits Monica McCoy, who's the president of the Ivy Education Foundation, making this possible. Please welcome Monica. Uh, <laughs> oh, feel that love, feel that love. And he's been a long distance runner, 51 years working and fighting and defending the rights of young people. He's with the Youth Recreation Association. Please welcome Mr. Don Calloway. <laughs> Monica, let's, let's, let's start with you. I mentioned earlier in this program that we accepted the invitation to come uh, be a part of this gathering. Every, every other place we've gone, we have built the audience from scratch, so to speak. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful for us that on the last stop, we were asked to be a part of something that was already ongoing. And when we got a chance to read about and to see and to learn more about the work that you all are doing, you wonderful AKAs are doing here and have been doing now for a decade, we were so moved by that that it made perfect sense for us to align ourselves with you, to accept your invitation to join in here and to help make the link between education and poverty. And Republicans and Democrats, everybody in this nation agrees that there's a direct link between these two issues, education and poverty. And we'll talk more to Mr. Calloway and, and, and Representative Pafford about that, but let me start with you and ask how you all got started making this issue of education uh, the centerpiece of your work, uh, what you've been doing for 10 years. Just give me an overview of what, what you all have been at for, for the last decade. Well, what's at the, at the forefront for Alpha Kappa Alpha is community service. And if we don't service our kids, then we leave no legacy. If we don't instill in them those things that the, our parents instilled in us, the importance of education, the importance of taking care of your bodies and health, the importance of taking care of your finances, then they are going to live in poverty. Mm -hmm. And we don't want our young people to live in par poverty. So 10 years ago, in addition to some of the other things that we do, we started this one day, all day youth symposium where we bring in um, people with expertise in those areas, education and health and in finance, and we give the kids some tidbits on how they can live and how they can improve their lives. We have two mentoring groups, a middle school group and a high school group, Precious Pearls and Twenty Pearls. We make them do community service. Mm -hmm. They have beautiful, to serve the beautiful. poor and the underprivileged. Um, um, just last year we delivered Thanksgiving baskets and there was a lady who was waiting outside because she thought we forgot. Mm. And it was because we were oh, running no. a little bit late and we got there and she had six kids and we delivered those four baskets of food and I think that was so impactful on our girls because on the way back they said, wow, we really have it good. We didn't realize how good we have it. So that's what it's all about. It's mm. all about service. It's all about not relying on others to always taking care of us, to take care of us, but we need to learn how to take care of ourselves. We've talked to so many people on this tour who are doing what you're doing, and that is to say, in their own way, trying to provide a service, or as Doc and I might say, trying to love and to serve. Since you've been doing this for 10 years, give me a sense of how you've seen the need for your work change or grow. Um, give me a sense of, of, of where you are now in terms of the need that you see in West Palm versus when you started doing this work 10 years ago. Well, when we started out, we had to kind of say, okay, let's beat the bushes. Let's know that, let the community know, let our community know that we're out there and that we're offering this service. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to shut down online registration for the kids because we had 197 kids wow. to register online to say, yes, I want to come and learn more about education. I want to learn more about finance. I want to learn about health. And then I had to get here and do some on-site registrations because we didn't want to turn any kid away. Mm -hmm. um, there is a need. We have parents that call us in terms of a mentor 
mentoring their kids, we make ourselves available within our youth groups. If we have students that are falling below a 2.5 to provide tutorial with SORAs who have areas of expertise in math and reading and whatever it takes to keep our kids um, on point where they be. We don't mind them enjoying themselves. We don't mind them partying. We don't mind them having some fun, but this is a real deal holy field. And we want to make sure that they understand <laughs> that health, education, and finance are the cornerstones for them pulling themselves up with our help, with their bootstraps, so that they can become leaders. Yes, indeed, indeed. Give a hand, give a hand. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. We so deeply appreciate having the state representative, our dear brother Marcus. We all agree it's too many poor people in Florida, too many poor people in West Palm Beach. How do you deal with the plight of poor people in the state house? <clears throat> well, you know, unfortunately in the state of Florida, uh, the government has is, is frankly been very anemic. Uh, there, there is really no leadership whatsoever. Uh, the mere mention of uh, the poor uh, generally isn't even uh, something you would hear in Tallahassee. And, and if you look, wow. and it, it was fantastic to hear some of your words, you know, uh, supporting people who support you, not because somebody's nice. You want to support people that are going to support you. At the end of the day, it's a simple vote you take. And, and you know, just as an example, uh, this past year we eliminated the Ho Homeless Coalition line item, over almost $3 million, uh, eliminated uh, maternal infant and early childhood uh, visiting grant. Uh, we reduced the contribution to local uh, health departments. I mean, it, just the mere fact that the, the state of Florida refuses to expand Medicaid when, you know, a, a, a single parent with a child, to, to be part of Medicaid right now at 22% of the poverty level, you basically have to make at or less than $3,500. All they want to do uh, is bring it up to 133% of the poverty level, which would be, in the same case, uh, fourteen to 15000 annually. Mm -hmm. We've got a state that's basically done nothing. And, and frankly, we've got a, a governor and, and leaders um, who have been completely uh, destructive to the state. Mm. This, issue, this issue of voter suppression. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's being, yeah. Very important issue. Very important issue. Being discussed all across the country, but what really kicked this conversation up to another level was, was the state of Florida. Since you're in the state house, um, tell me what we need to know about this issue, about what's happening in Florida, because again, it made all kind of, again, Florida made all kind of national news around this issue of voter suppression. Well, and, and specifically, it's uh, House Bill 1355, which, which did a number of things. It made it difficult for, for people to register, people to vote. Uh, it changed early voting uh, down to a small amount of days. But more importantly, uh, in terms of the, of the black community, in 2008, 50, almost 54 percent of turnout occurred during uh, early voting for the black community. And, and what you see is a, a very specific plan to eliminate uh, that voice in who we elect to be representatives in our state uh, leadership, whether it be governor or anybody else, or me. Uh, and and uh, this past year, you know, I sponsored a bill actually that would have reversed the four major items that the courts were looking at, and of course the bill never even got a hearing. Mm. Uh, and, and so there is a plan uh, in action, as far as I'm concerned, that works against everybody here. Uh, it, black, white, it doesn't matter. There is a plan to diminish the scope and the voice uh, that we have to elect our leaders, and it's, it's shocking that it's going on today, uh, yet it is, and we've all got a plan to do better than what that law meant us to do. We've got to work around that law to make sure we, we get out and, and say what we need to say and vote. Absolutely, absolutely. Now we know that we know that Martin Luther King Jr., when, when Martin Luther King Jr. was shot down like a dog in 1968, he was focusing on poverty and he was given a critique of what was going on in Vietnam. We, you all know you got a living legend here, Brother Dan Calloway. Living legend, 51 years of high quality service. And it's because he loves the people so. It is a national disgrace, not just here in Florida, but in every state that poverty is not at the center of our conversation, working people and poor people. Our dear brother Dan, thank you very give much. us your thoughts on this. <laughs> well, I think poverty is going to be among us all the time because of the poor. That's what the Bible says. The strong shall bear the infirmities of the weak. And as long as the, the strong people deny going into the 
byways and the highways mm. and the valleys and look out for the poor people, mm. we're going to have that. I spent over 51 years as an athletic director of something hmm. and over 25 years as uh, a member of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And in that time, and I want you to know I'm 74 years of age. 74 <laughs> years. <laughs> the, the thing about we are our brother's keeper hmm. and we have forgotten that. The Chinese one said that if you give me a fish, I'll eat for a day. But if you teach me how to fish, I'll eat for a lifetime. And that goes, if you give me, train me, educate my mind, I'll be able to try to get a job and do for myself and my brothers. I think that we, have, we make it difficult when we start crippling everybody and thinking they don't have to work. You need to have that work background to survive in this world. I was born in 38, and in 1948, being the four for four boys, we had our own garden. We had our own chickens and things like that. We ate off the fat of the land. We fished. We didn't ask for handouts. We were reared up in a segregated society. I finished from that high school right down the street at Roosevelt in 1956 when all this was water and alligators. Nothing was open here west of, this, <laughs> west of that railroad track. You got to stop highlighting what you don't have and be grateful for what you do have and, and work on that. In 1965, after spending three years in Europe and being cut by the Pittsburgh Pirates, I had to come back home and leave the fast life of New York because somebody in the valley and Martin Luther King made us understand that. Yes, Need yes. I help? Yes. It was yes. a young man by the name of Lamar Paris, and everybody knows that. He was a senior in high school, and he went off. We sent him to Lincoln University in uh, Missouri, and he played 14 years in NFL. Hmm. And from that day to this day, we have sent over 1,000 kids off to college whether they were in the athletic department, uh, in that field, or whether they were a teacher, it doesn't matter, as long as they went off the school. And we're still doing that. Now, we are part of uh, the culinary arts, trying to teach people how to be a cook, a chef. We are part of the uh, auto mechanics and the husbandry, um, different things that they need to do because everybody can't go to college, but everybody can work. And everybody need to have pride in him or herself that they are somebody. See, this is what Martin taught us when he spoke at that same in 1966 at Roosevelt campus. We are somebody. Mm -hmm. We are God's children. Mm -hmm. We are made in his image. He said, fleecy locks and black complexion. Nature cannot forfeit its claim. But skin may differ, but affection dwells in white and black the same. If you understand that you are somebody. Now, why he went back to the valley is to give everybody hope. When yes, you give yes, people hope yes. and make them feel good about themselves, they'll do better. Kids like that, they'll, they'll achieve great things when you let them know they're somebody. We're here to give them hope. And with 74 years of experience, yesterday with the uh, city of Rivera Beach, we're having a lot of problems with the shooting with the chief of police. We were talking yesterday and the uh, assistant chief we're going to set up programs. We are feeding people all the time. Dr. Fred Eva Nelson was in here earlier on the third Wednesday of next month. We're going to the uh, senior citizen home. We can't forget about people like that. Misfortune going to happen to everybody, but we're supposed to join hands. When I walk through the door, I'm supposed to grab Monica hand. If everybody link hands, the old coach at Houston, um, he said, hold the rope. If you hold a rope, nobody will fall. And that's what we are doing, holding the rope. Holding the rope. We got to. Wonderful. Wonderful. We got to take a short break here, a short break. When we come back, though, I want to pick up, Mr. Callaway, on the point that you made about the fact that everybody needs to work uh, and people want to work. We agree with that. The question is, what do you do when there isn't enough work? for so many millions of Americans. We'll talk about that and more in just a moment. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0.
live in West Palm Beach, Florida at the Roosevelt Middle School, brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. We're back in a moment. Give the band some love. Yeah. That's the Roosevelt Middle School oh. Marching Band. We are live in West Palm Beach, Florida. I'm Tavis Smiley. Cornell West. And this is the final stop, again, on our Four State Poverty 2.0 tour. We went out last year, in case you just tuned in, went out last year to nine states, 18 cities. Earlier this year, another 20 cities on our book tour for the rich and the rest of us talking about poverty. And now, we are in West Palm Beach, Florida, Last stop on this four swing state tour of Ohio and Virginia, Pennsylvania, and we wrap in Florida. Before the break, Mr. Callaway was making the point, uh, and I can't be as, uh, as uh, profound as he was, but making the point that people want to work, that people need to work, that people should work, that there is dignity in work. Uh, Dr. West and I agree with all that. The question is what happens when there isn't enough work? What happens when political indifference and corporate greed, uh, multinational companies, multinationals rather, making more money here, shipping more jobs abroad? I don't believe that people ought to depend on government looking for a handout either. But the question, uh, State Representative Pafford, is what do we do when the government doesn't step up to the, to the plate and, and, and engage its role in making sure um, that Americans have the means to exercise their gifts. I mean, we, we, Mr. Callaway was talking about Dr. King, and I regard Dr. King as does Dr. West. We regard Dr. King as the greatest American this country has ever produced. Dr. King, to my mind, is the greatest American this country has ever produced. But that march on Washington wasn't just about protesting about civil rights. It was about jobs and freedom and peace. So Martin King wanted people to have access to good jobs not minimum wage, but living wage jobs. So Mr. Callaway's point, Doc and I agree with, I think, wholeheartedly. The question again is, what do you do when people want to work? There are millions of Americans right now who would do anything to find a job. So many of them unemployed and underemployed. So it's not a matter of people not wanting to work. So many right now don't have the opportunity to work. Well, and, and if I could add to that, it, it's, it's also uh, the type of work. You know, in this state, uh, you can be providing the most intimate type of care in a skilled nursing facility, in an ALF, uh, and your wage is the same as somebody who handed you the cup of coffee at McDonald's. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very complex type of issue, but the first thing you do is you find some ability to lead and talk about industries that are going to provide that type of base for uh, economic industry. You know, th this state, uh, unfortunately, it, it rests uh, too often on the fact that we have beaches and, and we, we, you know, the hotel management and, and uh, I'm sorry, the, ho the industries, uh, mm -hmm of tourism, sure. they are a big thing, but you know, we, we've grown. We've got 19 me million people in this state and, and we've got to begin uh, being creative and allowing people to understand uh, and, and know that quality of life that they earn uh, so they can enjoy their lives rather than struggle, which is what we're seeing. And right now, uh, again, you know, there is no leadership. There is, I said during the break, nobody talks about the poor. 
Nobody talks about the poor, and it's, it's a tragedy, and we're losing people, uh, not only uh, out of state, but we're losing people. We're losing generations of people because we're not investing, there's nothing wrong with that, investing in people. Uh, and until we do that, unfortunately, there'll probably be a poverty tour 3.0, but you'll have the support, and hopefully everybody here will go home and share the importance of being involved. Without you, uh, we're no good. You, you direct uh, everything about who we are as a society, and you have to take control. Yes, 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 yes. There, um, absolutely. I want to just ask yeah. Sister Monica a question, because Brother Dan said that we no longer are our brothers and sisters keeper in the way in which we were in the past. In the past, even if we were poor, we grew up in neighborhoods where there was love and concern. Hoods are something else. Drugs violence, bullets, unemployment, dilapidated housing, school systems that are not up to the grade relative to the precious children they serve. How do we account for that, that, that shift? It's a downward shift. It's a decline in terms of what we had in the past where we cared much more for one another, Sister Monica. Well, no, no, but no, that was directed to, so I, I was using your point, Brother Dan, but that was directed to Sister Monica because she's an example of somebody who cares. Well, well I think what we need to do in terms, of, in terms of, of looking outside, we need to look outside and make others accountable, but we also need to look at ourselves, those of us who, who are in positions to help young people that we know need jobs, then we need to look out for them. We need to make sure that they have the education they need, that they, are, that they are prepared, and when they come back to our area and we're in a position to help them, then we need to say, you know what, that's Ms. Leela's boy. He just got back in town. He graduated with a degree in business, and I'm over here in this position where I can help Ms. Leela's boy get a job. So I need to be calling Ms. Leela's boy, saying, Ms. Leela's boy, position is, this position is available. I need to see your application come across my desk, and these are the things that you need. We need to start looking out for our own. Yes, there's some things that are happening that we have no control over, but those of us who do have position, those of us who do have some influence, those of us who do have some authority, we need to look out for our own. Now, don't, am I saying that you give them a handout? No, you don't give them a job to be a mathematician if they don't know how to do math. But if you know Miss Lilla's boy knows how to do math and that he graduated and he has a degree and he's coming back and looking for a job, we need to That's look right. out for Miss Lilla's boy and let him know that he needs to fill out that That's application. Right. Yeah. We need to tell Miss Lilla's boy when he comes for the interview, his pants needs to pull up. He, he needs to have on a suit and a tie. He needs to speak correct English, not the text language that he has on the phone and he needs to present himself yes. so that when we're sitting on the panel and we're looking at Miss Leela's board, we can give a nod and be okay with it. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Calloway, I, um, one, one of the things that you see here in West Palm Beach and this is not to cast aspersion on West Palm, I love West Palm because I, I come from a community where the same thing is true and so many people of color and others in this country understand this on the reservation, in white communities, in Hispanic communities. So much of what America wrestles with is not just poverty, but generational poverty. It'd be one thing if one generation had to wrestle with this and we could move beyond it. Um, but in so many of our families, and I, I know this is the case here in West Palm, I've seen the data, so much, so much of this is not just poverty, it's generational poverty. I, I want to ask you about this because you've been at this for 51 years working on these kinds of issues, particularly where young people are concerned. But what say you about the fact that we are burdened by what is generational poverty in our community so often? Well, one of the things before I answer that about the jobs, Florida is a state depending on tourism and, and building the construction trade. When people get big contracts from the government, local government, they allow people to import people with, for under wages from out of the country or wherever. I'm not against immigration, but you can't take the job from the local people. They should be the first people in line to get the jobs. Mm -hmm. See, this is what happened when people in the labor pool you got the local people fighting hard because they won't work for under wages when you bring in other people who will work under wages because it's much more money than maybe in their country. 
and that's not fair. But the generation of poverty is babies having babies is the worst thing ever happened in our society. It decimates our society because they can't teach the baby because they're only a baby. And so when a, a, a grandmother in Stony Brook three months ago had a three-year-old daughter and she's only 32 years of age, that's tough. That's really tough because she, she had a baby at 14. Her baby it was 14, had a baby, now at 32, she has a three-year-old granddaughter. We have to stop that. We have to educate the masses that you need to be able to be matured enough to handle children. Children going, taking care of children is the worst thing we got. And then one, it's a cycle. If I'm, if I'm on housing, and I don't have anything against housing, but you need to work hard to get off housing. Be proud. <laughs> Those are the things that really just destroy and cause a lot of criminal activities because all at once you get a complex thinking that nobody care for you and then you go to the gangs and the gangs love each other and support each other. Now you go out and do dumb things. We have to break the cycle. And the only way we're going to break the cycle, we all going to have to join hands and say enough is enough. We have to stand up. It's only 8 to 10% of the people are bad. But 90% of the people sit on the sidelines, so when you do it or he'll, he'll do it or something like that, we right. all must do it. Simple as that. Representative Pafford, uh, I hear Mr. Callaway and I agree again that at some point people, particularly poor people, have got to say enough is enough. Yes. As an elected official, you understand this perhaps better than anybody in the room. Um, and that is that it's one thing for folk to be fed up with conditions. It's another thing for them to mobilize, to organize. We have to beg people to vote. That it's is the true. most precious right we have. We have to beg them to vote. So as an elected official, what say you about, you know, the juxtaposition of being sick and tired of what we have to deal with, but not getting to the point of organizing and mobilizing, and I don't think that voting is the answer to everything, but it's just one example of how you have to beg people even to do that. I was glad to hear Monica say that they had, you know, more people who wanted to get in today they could even really accommodate. Uh, that's a beautiful thing to see young people thirsty for hunger, I mean, thirsty for knowledge and hungry for empowerment. Um, I love that. Um, but what about those persons, which is quite frankly, the majority of Americans who are fed up with a whole lot of conditions, poverty being one of them, but don't ever get around to doing anything about it. Yeah, and, and I think some of that lies in the fact that we've allowed uh, our, our corporations to have so much control and so much influence, uh, and you know, everybody's seen it. They've either getting it on, in the mail or on television. Uh, and, and what you have to understand, and, and hopefully that majority out there that is going to make the difference, because it will be them, uh, understands that the first flag that anybody should be aware of is when something says paid political advertisement, paid for and approved by the guy that gave it to you. That's, that's a dangerous type of activity. When you compound that with billions of dollars, uh, you are looking at corporations that are persuading you to vote against yourself. Uh, no matter how many dollars are out there, uh, at the end of the day, we all are going to have a certain period to engage in our destiny, in our future that affects us, that investment of people, uh, of money, and investment in society. Uh, and at the end of the day, it really is up to you to understand who is going to support you and who is not going to support you. And it's beyond a piece of paper or a television ad. It actually means engaging in a discussion with people that you trust and, and, and doing your homework and educating yourselves about people who say they're supporting you, but every single moment of their political life, they're voting against you. And, and unfortunately, I think it, it really begins to mobilize when it hurts people people most and, and unfortunately that's in their pocketbook and I think now is the moment we must uh, embrace our future uh, get involved as Mr. Callaway said let's get educated uh, and there's no one in this room that's attending and being part of this that should not be uh, involved it is your obligation and responsibility uh, to help all of us uh, as individuals you can make that difference 
I, mean, I know the uh, precious young folk just walked in with the drums, and I think it's very important to acknowledge that uh, the drum not only comes from Africa, but the drum was banned against black people, both on the slave ships and on the plantations, because those drums were a form of lifting one's voice and encouraging each other and being able to relate in harmony to something bigger than you. So we're talking about fighting for justice. Brother Mark talks about fighting for justice against big money, fighting for justice against racism. It should be against sexism. It should be against anti-Semitism, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sensibility. These drums, every time you play these drums, that's connected to your history. Do you feel powerful playing the drums? You feel, you feel something. That's a little tip. That's what this brother. Oh, that's what this brother understands. Give a hand to the to the teacher who's teaching them how to play this drum. Give my hand. So it's not just an instrument; it's part of a history. So then you can straighten your back up and love each other. Not just black people, everybody. But you don't want black folk who love everybody but black people. You want black people who love everybody. Amen. And sometimes it's harder to love people who hate themselves. Amen. And these drums are a way of affirming who you are and connecting you to a human family in this regard. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why we have this music connected to this dialogue. I got, I got a minute left. I want to give Monica 30 seconds and Mr. Calloway 30 seconds, literally, uh, so I can hit this break right on time. But I'm curious, starting with you, uh, Monica, as to what makes you hopeful. I love everything that Doc just laid out, and what he reminds us of is that we have survived more difficult times. Absolutely. As tough as these times are, That's right. that drum that he just talked about reminds us that we've, we've gotten through worse. But given what you're up against and what you see you're dealing with every year, you and your AKA Soros, what, what makes you hopeful every year that you do this program? Mm. What makes us hopeful is when we have to make tough decisions because we have so many students with above 3.0s that look like us mm -hmm. applying for our scholarship. And we've given over $300,000 in scholarship wow. over the last 55 wow. years. What makes us hopeful, yes. What, yes. What, what makes us hopeful is when you have a 20 pearl that's in your high school mentoring group, you've had her since the ninth grade and she's had a 4.0 cumulative G point GPA from the ninth grade and she's in the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. What makes wow. us hopeful is when you have, you're tired, you don't want to be bothered, and you get that call and say, well, Miss Monica, can we do X, Y, Z today? And that gives you what you need to just go forward. So I think the young people is, it, the young people for us are those that give us hope in terms of knowing that we need to stay the course to do what mm -hmm. we need to do to make sure that they do what they need to do. Mr. Calloway, I got 30 seconds, sir, right quick. What, what makes you hopeful? After all these years, you've been in the struggle. 51 well, years. I had the privilege to be taught by some great teachers at Roosevelt and the Palm View and uh, whatever, and even at Washington Junior High School, because my teachers were so good parents. They were more than just teachers. They taught us life. And Mrs. Hutnell and Mr. McDonald are still teaching me, and I'm 74. I think that it's imperative that we all become leaders and doers and rather be complainers and followers. Mr. Dan Calloway, thank you, please. Thanks to State Representative Mark Paver, we thank you. And Monica McCoy, we especially thank you and your AKA sisters. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0 from West Palm Beach, Florida, brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One.
go in and just go that way. Welcome back to the Poverty Tour 2.0. We are at Roosevelt Middle School in West Palm Beach, Florida. Palm Beach, this is Florida. the final stop on what has been, this time around, a four-state, four-swing state poverty tour. This one called the Poverty Tour 2.0. Let's give some love to the band one more time. The Roosevelt Middle School Marching Band. We're pleased to be joined now by Geraldo Reyes, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Uh, we have been talking to um, all kinds of Americans, Geraldo, as we've been traveling the country. And one of the, one of the things that disturbs uh, myself, disturbs me and, and, and Dr. Weston, Dr. Weston, yours truly, is this notion of um, the working poor. In our, in our book, The Rich and the Rest of Us, we talk about how bankrupt the language is around poverty. The language is so bankrupt. When we talk about minimum wage, we ought to be talking about a living wage. Mm -hmm. We talk about the poor, and we use the phrase the working poor. What does that mean? If you work, you ought not to be poor in the richest nation in the world. But we use that phrase, working poor, with such ease. Uh, and my favorite, a jobless recovery. What is a jobless recovery? Uh, the economists tell us we, we are in recovery, but it's a jobless recovery. Well, pardon me, if there ain't no jobs, there ain't no recovery. But our language around these issues is, is so very wrong. Um, so even Americans who are working still remain poor. But we're, we're, we're curious to hear more about the work that you're doing with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Um, uh, please, welcome, please welcome Brother Gerardo Reyes. Well, first of all, let me say that it is an honor to be here today um, and to be sharing a little bit of what we do. Um, I'm a farm worker. I'm a staff member of the Coalition of Immokali Workers. And uh, one of the things that I want to share is uh, a little bit about Immokali. Immokali is a town that's uh, really close to here, like two and a half hours away. It's uh, the center of the labor force for the industry, the agricultural industry. Um, we work for companies that are based also in the southwest part of Florida that have land all over the east coast. So we work from October to May with these companies uh, in the tomato industry, which is one of the biggest industries. Um, and we follow the season uh, after May for a few months and then come back again. So we do all the cycle. Some of the conditions that I want to uh, talk about that exist in the tomato industry are among uh, some of the worst conditions combined together in one single job. Stagnant wages, for example. Uh, today, a farm worker receives a average pay of 50 cents per a 32 pound bucket of tomatoes, which means that in a normal day, working by piece, you need to pick around two and a half tons to make just the equivalent of the minimum wage of the state of Florida. This, along with verbal and physical abuse, uh, sexual harassment across the entire industry, um, and in, in the most extreme of the cases, situations of modern day slavery, where workers have been forced to work, in some cases at gunpoint, in, in every case under threats of death for them and sometimes even for their families. So, that's what's going on and that's where we come from. The Coalition of Immokalee Workers started to basically fight back against all of these abuses. Some of the actions that happen in Immokalee include three general stoppages with over 3,000 workers in 95, 
97 and 99. Um, there was a 30-day hunger strike uh, by six members. And I'm going to apologize a little bit for my English because it is my second language. Um, so those were some of the actions that happened asking for two things from the tomato industry. Uh, we asked for a place in the table to have dialogue about how to improve the conditions and the wages. And every time that we try to establish dialogue with them, uh, we, we hit a wall. There were, there were some things that were uh, brought to us. One of them was that they couldn't pay more because they were being squeezed by the market. And then uh, they refused to sit at the table with us in, on all of these years. So we thought, as farm workers, how are we going to be able to make systemic change in an industry that refused to first recognize the problems or, or deny them? They would say, there's no such abuse going on within the industry. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't have the money to give you an increase. We're being squeezed. So we started to analyze the market, analyze how the big buyers use their, their incredible buying power to drive prices down. And that's how we came into what we uh, call the campaign for fair food. Uh, if you think about it, 50 years ago, there was no like big chains like McDonald's, Burger King, Subway. They were just general, uh, regional um, chains somewhere in the United States. They were small operations. They started to grow, and with their growth, they started to demand more production. But they started to also dictate prices. So when they grew up to the size that we know now, where you turn around and you see a McDonald's everywhere, you see a Burger King everywhere, what they did is they maximize, uh, in order to maximize profits, they push the prices down. They demanded a artificially low price for the tomatoes they needed on their operations. What that created is workers at the bottom um, were paying the price because the tomato industry, in that sense, that part of the argument was right. They were being squeezed. So the corporations needed to also take responsibility for that and work with us. And we knew that in order to change the entire the entire way the production of uh, tomatoes was going on, we needed to bring these big buyers mm -hmm. on board. Mm -hmm. I, I know that there are a lot of people, Doc, Doc mm -hmm. who just in the last five minutes, I didn't want to interrupt Gerardo, I want to let him get his, get his point out. Um, I know there are people in the last five minutes who've received more education about the exploitation of some U.S. workers than they've ever known, just in five minutes, just that one synopsis. Yeah, yeah allows people to understand that sometimes unwittingly, sometimes unwittingly, poor people are exploited by other poor people. What do you mean, Tavis? We all love tomatoes. There may be a couple of us in who don't like tomatoes, but on our salads, on our burgers, we all eat tomatoes. And it's fascinating to me sometimes how poor people, again, are exploited by other poor people. But they don't even know, they are unaware of what conditions are that produced the stuff that you take for granted that you eat. Which leads me to this question, Brother Gerardo. I wonder to what extent you think, it's not their fault necessarily that they don't know, but what, to what extent do you think the general population understands the hell that you all have to endure to put tomatoes in the grocery store for us to have on our dinner table? You think most folk understand what you just laid out? I think that uh, many people don't. Uh, many people don't have an idea that there are workers in the other end uh, enduring these conditions. But it's a, a process that we are trying to address with the Campaign for Fair Food. We uh, organize tours, national tours, uh, with workers to talk about precisely these things. We go to many universities. Uh, we talk to people in churches. Uh, we address uh, union members, other organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're trying to do what we can uh, with the limited resources we have, uh, and more and more people are waking up to this reality. We, we uh, often make a comparison about the power the market have versus the power 
we have. And uh, I could say without a doubt that in one hand, yeah, we're going against, up against a power that can create images and phrases that we can learn really fast and absorb really fast. But over time, those phrases are not important anymore. They are important in the moment when somebody injects millions or billions of dollars in publicity campaigns. But there's the power that confronts that, which is the power of conscience, the power of knowing mm -hmm. the person's humanity, the, the, the person at the other end uh, that was invisible for so long. When we talk about these things, when we talk about the abuses going on, people wake up. When we talk about slavery, and I'm going to uh, mention a couple of cases just to give you a sense of what we are talking about when we say slavery. Uh, people wake up to this reality and, and start to question the food system, they start to question the big chains and what they are doing, and they start to organize also with us. There's many groups of people in different parts of the country, New York, Chicago, California, Texas, everywhere, that are organizing to spread the word. So it's, it's an ongoing effort. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the power of money will never overcome the power of consciousness. Over time, this power will stay with the person who absorbs that information. And then little by little, this is lower, but it's an ongoing and unstoppable process that knows no limits in terms of generations or borders or anything. It's an ongoing process and we will arrive to the point where mm. everyone is gonna have the same question in their mind. Where is our food coming from? And what are the conditions? And if they are not fair, then people are gonna rise. That's our hope yeah. and we know yeah. it's gonna happen. It's happening little by little. Yeah, step by step, step by step. I mean, as you know, this. This poverty tour was a call for conscience. And it was a building on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, but also Cesar Chavez and Dolores Welta and others. We live in a system that puts profits over people, especially big banks, big corporations, too many poor people. I got a delicate question for you, my brother. Uh-oh, beware when Doc ask a <laughs> delicate question. <laughs> You know and I know that there's too many Latinos who have stereotypes of black people. Mm -hmm. Too many black people have stereotypes of Latinos. How do we create situations where we can work together as human beings and workers against powers that be when these stereotypes are still operating and in which there's racist perceptions mm -hmm. still operating? From our perspective, mm -hmm. it is an issue about seeing the humanity on each other. Mm -hmm. it's, it's as basic as that. If we are able to talk about things that affect both communities, things that are coming from the top, but mm -hmm. makes us so mm -hmm. confused because we r very rarely look to the top and ask the questions to them. Why is it that we are poor? who's creating this poverty. Once we look to the top all together and see in each other's eyes the chance to be able to change the realities we are facing, we're gonna see each other differently too. So I think that by working together, yes, we yes. will be able to little by little eliminate all of those problems, all of those stereotypes. But we need to be real about it. Mm -hmm. it, it will be uh, there will be situations, there will be problems, right. but it is an ongoing process of change for oneself as part of a movement that we're trying to create. Geraldo, let, let me ask you right quick. I've got about four minutes and I've got to go to a break. And before I ask this question, for those in the audience, there's a microphone to my left. Don't move now. Don't move now. There's a microphone on the floor here to my left. And in the next segment, which will be about 20 minutes long, uh, we're going to get to that segment in about three or four minutes. When we get to that last segment in this hour, um, there's going to be about 20 minutes where we want to engage your questions or comments on Geraldo's comments or anything else you've heard or not heard today. We want to, at various points throughout this town hall, hear from you and let the national audience hear your thoughts, your questions, your comments. So when I call for it, there's a microphone here. Get your thoughts together, and we want to hear from you 
uh, on national TV and national radio here in just a few minutes. Having said that, with the three and a half minutes we have left before this break, Doc asked a delicate and beautiful question about coalition uh, work between black and brown. You referenced earlier that you had a couple of examples of what you meant by slavery. Whenever you tell a room full of black folk, whenever you use the word slavery, that's a serious comparison. You know, it's like saying to a Jewish audience that something felt like a Holocaust. That's, there's just certain words and phrases that you gotta be able to back up. I'm sure you can. Yep. But when you say, when you use the word slavery, that these workers are working in slave-like conditions, give me one or two examples right quick in three minutes. Very good. Very good. Um, there are the conditions that are the norm that allow for extreme conditions to happen. When workers have no voice in the place where they work, when they are not seen as human, but as mere tools for the system, has to do the work, mm -hmm. this extreme abuse has happened. And I'm going to give you a few examples. There's been seven cases that have happened since 1997 until today, where over 1,000 workers have been liberated from these conditions. Um, 15 bosses are in jail. One of the cases, just to give you uh, these two examples, in 2007, a uh, Florida employer, Ron Evans, was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison on drug conspiracy, financial restructuring, and witness tempering charges. Among others, his wife, Jaquita Evans, was also sentenced to 20 years, and his uh, son to 10 years, operating in Florida and North Carolina. Um, Evans deducted rent, food, crack cocaine, because they established their business with their labor force, and the workers in this case were recruited from homeless shelters. It was African-American workers mainly, um, American citizens, and uh, that was one of the cases that was brought to court. Right. They were inside this place where they, there was fences to prevent them from living, and there was obviously the threats of death. Mm. Another case, wow. Uh, wow. Navarrete case, it happened in Imokali. This case involved uh, workers who were forced to sleep inside a U-Haul truck. They were constantly bitten in the place where they were sleeping, in the place where they would be taken to work, and they were literally chained inside this U-Haul truck. One of the workers was caught with a knife across the stomach, and when they were able to escape, escape uh, through the ventilation hatch, they came to the police, and at the same time they came to the coalition of Imokali workers. When they arrived, they still had the marks on their wrist of the chains that they used to hold them in this really cruel case of slavery. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about slavery, we're talking about situations that have been prosecuted uh, using the same laws that were used before uh, uh, many, many years ago. So we're not, uh, I mean, it, it is a really, really violent issue. That's the stream of the norm, normal conditions that we face. And we're talking about Florida in the United States of America. Mm. Um, this is a very real issue. We'll continue our conversation with Brother Gerardo uh, of the Coalition of Amoncolay Workers. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0 uh, in West Palm Beach, Florida, the last stop on a four battleground state tour, talking about how we prioritize and eradicate poverty in this country. When we come back, We'll talk with the audience. This is being brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One.
love for the Roosevelt Middle School Marching Band. Give them some love again. Give them some more love. Give the band, the marching band, some love. We're in West Palm Beach, Florida. I'm Tavis Smiley. I'm Cornell West. And this is the Poverty Tour 2.0, the last stop after Ohio and Virginia and Pennsylvania. This is the last stop on our tour this time around as we try to talk about why we can't seem to get some traction on the issue of poverty in America, even though one out of two Americans now is either in or near poverty. 50 million Americans will go to bed tonight without enough to eat. Nine million of those are children. A report came out the other day from the Capital Kids Foundation that found, hear this, the childhood poverty rate in Washington, D.C. is higher, worse than the childhood poverty rate in Mexico. The childhood poverty rate in the nation's capital of the richest nation in the world is higher than the childhood poverty rate in Mexico. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we are up against, and this is why Dr. West and I are out on the road trying to get this issue again uh, pushed higher on the American agenda and unapologetically pushing really hard to get the moderators of these four upcoming presidential debates, Bob Schieffer and Jim Lehrer and Martha Raddatz and Candy Crowley, trying to get these four Americans who've been honored to moderate these upcoming presidential debates to make sure the issue of poverty gets discussed during these upcoming debates. Check this out. In 2008, when Mr. Obama, then Senator Obama, and Senator John McCain were running against each other, there were three presidential debates. You watched them, I watched them, we all watched them. Three presidential debates the last time around. The word poor or poverty did not come up one time in three debates. In three debates, Obama never raised it, McCain never raised it, the moderators never asked about it. Fast forward four years, look at the conditions that we are now suffering in vis-a-vis -vis poverty, and tell me how we can abide another series of presidential debates where we don't get around to discussing how we're going to reduce and eradicate poverty in this country. So Doc and I have argued on this tour that poverty is threatening our very democracy. Poverty is a matter of national security. And either we take this issue seriously or we lose our democracy. It's really that stark, That's but it's that simple. And as an issue, it is a moral and spiritual issue, as well as political and economic. It has to do with how we treat our fellow human beings. Our brother has just described conditions that are wrong, unjust, and immoral, no matter what color one is. In fact, when Tavis came up with this idea of the poverty tour a year and a half ago, my own request was to begin on the Indian reservation and then get to poor communities. Because you all know the history of America began with the encounter of who was already here, indigenous peoples, and all the suffering that they've had to go through. And we're talking about an issue that affects persons of different colors and different cultures. And we thank you. Why don't you just give your hotline, though, brother, before we move to the questions? If the people want to make contact with you for the national audience. Um, yeah. They can uh, we have a website visit address? our website, yeah. which is uh, ciw-online.org, uh, or they can also contact our office at 239-657-8311. There's also a table with a lot of information over there. Oh, good. Um, all of that is for free, and people can sign the sheet. There's a table uh, in the back of the room with information. Again, that website address is ciw-online.org, fighting for fair food. We'll continue conversation with Brother Geraldo in a second, but I promise now we get some audience questions. I know I can't do all these in this one break, but we'll do more questions in the next hour as well. So we'll just get as far as we can get until Jay. This is Jay Z. It's our producer. Say hi to Jay Z, y'all. Say hi, Jay Z. Hi, Jay Z. Hi, Jay -Z. I know he don't look like Jay Z, but he is. His name is Joe Zephyrin. His name is Joe Zephyrin. He's our producer. He's our Jay Z. So that's Jay Z. So until Jay Z tells me I got a break, we'll cover as many questions as we can. Question, comment, I don't care what it is, but get right to it. Yes, sir. Uh it's a question and a Florida comment. May be better it's actually known concerning its outsourcing. I but work for a Fortune 500 company, and they outsource a lot of jobs. Of and when I look at it, it's not one job because it's a family involved. And but.
but not only that, that that person and that family lost that income, but uh, we lost income here. That company's still making that those dollars. That's right. But in the U.S., we lost those dollars. How do we get the, those jobs back from outsourcing? It's a powerful question. You know, you remember the, the, part, the story in the book we tell about Steve Jobs? Oh, yes. You remember that story? Yes, yes, you tell Can that. I tell that right quick? Yeah, absolutely. It's a powerful question. In our book, The Rich and the Rest of Us, we have a whole section about outsourcing. President Obama, to his credit, a few months ago, actually it is in his State of the Union speech earlier this year, you recall, talked a lot about what he called insourcing. He wanted to push really hard for insourcing, getting those jobs back. In our book, The Rich and the Rest of Us, we tell a story, a true story, of President Obama, after he'd gotten elected, his first meeting with Steve Jobs, the now late Steve Jobs of Apple. He has a meeting with Steve Jobs and he asks Steve how these jobs that have been shipped abroad, how he can get them back. He was asking him this question because he was already thinking about his insourcing idea. And he was trying to develop his plan to present to, them, to the nation, which he obviously did again in January of this year, about insourcing. How do we get these jobs back to America? So he asked Steve Jobs, I mean, this guy runs Apple, one of the most innovative thinkers and innovative companies with thousands and thousands of employees and people around the world that work with them and for them. So he thought he was asking the right person. So he says to Steve, how do I get these jobs back? And Steve Jobs looked at President Obama, he says, are you serious, quote, are you serious? Those jobs are not coming back. This is Steve Jobs, the head of a major American corporation, telling the President of the United States, those jobs that have been shipped abroad are not coming back. The President was flummoxed, speechless. And he and Mr. Jobs went on to have a conversation. Mr. Jobs, as we tell the story in the book, explained his point of view about that. So what, what Doc and I do in the book is then to go the next step and to ask the question, was Steve Jobs right? Will all these thousands of jobs that have been shipped abroad, multinationals, to your point, making more money at home, shipping more jobs abroad, will those jobs ever come back? Doc and I have concluded that it's an open question. And for me, I'll let Doc speak for himself, for me, I'm trying to see the light. I'm not a, Doc and I will both tell you, we're not optimists. We are prisoners of hope. That's just part of being black men. We don't have a whole lot to be optimistic about. Optimism suggests there's a particular fact, set of facts or circumstances, conditions, something you can see, feel, or touch that gives you reason to believe that things are going to get better. That's optimism. We're prisoners of hope. Because hope is the, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we're a faithful people. We're a hopeful people. That's the street on which we live. Um, so we're not optimists. But on this question, I don't know what the reason would be for any American corporate CEO to put Americans who they've downsized back to work. I'm still looking for that reason. The only reason why you bring back those employees is because your, the demand for your product is so high that you have to bring those employees back. And even then, if you can exploit cheap labor around the world, why bring Americans back to, to work on those jobs? The bottom line is, these companies have figured out that they can squeeze the middle class, squeeze more profit in the process out for the shareholders. So I don't see the reason, the rationale, to ever bring those jobs back. That's my sense of it. I hope I'm wrong about that, but I ain't seen the light on that yet. And just very briefly, I'm so glad you asked the question because part of the problem is most of the American people don't know the truth about this situation. The big companies want big profits. They can make big profits by going outside of the country for cheaper labor. And they keep their profits oftentimes offshore so only one out of five corporations even pay taxes and working people lucky to get a job still have to pay taxes that's wrong that's unjust so that the motivation behind the offsourcing is putting profits over people then the question becomes how do you fight back and that's what this whole tour is all about and then we'll go right 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 to our next one thank you, thank you for your question hey, how you doing brother tavis doing? and, and we, we like we like your t-shirt Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, That's what they were wearing when I, Martin I Luther King was marching with him. You know that, brother. I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, my name is Christian Garion. I'm the son of Haiti. And my friend flew from Haiti yesterday because he knew you guys were coming to talk about poverty. And most of the world know Haiti as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, which is partially true. But at the same time, there's another part of the story that's never been told. Uh, as far as being optimist and hopeful, I think 
we as the son of Haiti are very optimistic about the future. Even though, when you're looking at the media, everything you hear is negative. Let me tell you what I do and who I am and why I'm here today and what I think we as black people need to do to support each other to move forward. I'm the president of an organization called the Millennials Project. The Millennials Project is an organization I founded in 2009 because of a vision that I have of Frederick Douglass when he went to Haiti in 1891 and he was speaking to a group of Americans to give him a better understanding about this new republic founded by, founded by slaves and a republic founded by slave owners, which is a contradictory in the idea of freedom. Right. So uh, he made a statement. He says that there may come a time in history, even the weakness, that's the words of Frederick Douglass, even the weakness of Haiti may be strength to the United States. And I believe the time is now. I'm launching a campaign because my belief as the way forward for America is the women empowerment. I believe that, that's why I founded the organization in 2009, is the men of my generation have to be better. They have to support women and invest and trust in their instinct and intelligence so they can help and move the country forward. As of right now, I launch, I'm launching a campaign called Thank Better you. Men. I'm, I'm launching a campaign that I call I Am A Better Man, which is to focus on domestic violence. Violence against women yes. is our first step, and I definitely would love to have you to lend your voice and help me, because I have a video right now that's getting 50, 52 hits per day on YouTube. And I would love for you to share that video where I explain my philosophy, my story, and why I believe. Oh, that's everybody. beautiful. Let's give our two brothers Thank from Thank you very much. Hand. I appreciate it. Give our two brothers. No, yeah. we... Oh, no, go to the next one, go to the next one, no, 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 go together, go oh, together. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's go. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right, let's go next. My name, my name is Montreal Evans, and I just want to ask if our ancestors fight for the rights of our education, then why do black people get in trouble so much that they don't, they drop out of school, they go to jail, and they get killed? Wow, that's a deep question, brother. Give our brother a hand. Deep question, yeah. Yeah, eloquent question. But no, but brother, let, let, let him stay there so I can look in his eyes when we talk to each other. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That sometimes, my brother, even when you fight, you don't win every battle. And black people have been fighting, poor people have been fighting. We have won many battles, but we have not won the battle that allows all of us, especially young people, not to have to deal with poverty. So when you fight, you, know, you don't get victories across the board. Sometimes you get pushed back, you see, so that you keep fighting, you keep pushing. And that's part of what Tavis meant by hope, and this is when our Haitian brother talked about optimism and, and hope, you see. If optimism is thinking that things are going to get better but don't have to fight, hope is when you fight, you have some victories, but you don't have all of them. So hope is you just keep going no matter what. So I would say even our Haitian brothers are full of hope. And I want you to be full of hope. But even when you're full of hope, even when you fight in your life, brother, you're not going to win every battle. But don't give up. Don't cave in. When you don't win, you keep fighting anyway. But that's a deep question you asked, though, brother. Thank you. Thank you for your question, brother. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Harry. Hi, I'm Harry. Ever since I was a little boy sit riding in the car, I would look out the window and see homeless people on the ground and the grass just laying there. And I would just talk to my mom, and sometimes I would even cry just staring at it. And ever since I was a little kid, I just wanted to get a million dollars so I could invest in a business to help homeless people and just give them new jobs, clothes, and teach them how to do this and get them new degrees in college and certain types of schools that they couldn't make up when they were little children. And I just want to give them a second chance. Did, did, did everybody hear that question? The young brother said when he, ever since he has been a young, young, young brother riding in the car with his mother, he looks out and sees a homeless, 
He says he dedicates his life to fighting for the homeless. He wants to get a, a business with money so that he can eliminate homelessness. And that's what we're talking about. You care, you're concerned, and you want to make sure that people live lives of decency. We thank you so much for that. We appreciate the work that you're doing, young man. Um, we, we were in some city the other day, and we got into a, uh, oh, in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. We had a deep conversation about homelessness. For those who've been around a while, you'll, 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 uh, you'll relate to this. During the Reagan years, specifically, there was a great deal of conversation about homelessness in this country. In San Francisco and in Los Angeles and in New York, all the major cities. This was a cover story in Time Magazine and Newsweek and front page New York Times. There was a moment in that Reagan era where homelessness was a major front and center conversation. I don't know what happened where homelessness just disappeared, fell off of the agenda of important items to be discussed in this country. But homelessness is back on the rise again. It's on the rise because folk are losing their homes as a result of losing their jobs. The shelters in this country are full. I've already told you a few times today, the food pantry lines are long at, longer than ever. So homelessness is back on the increase. And so I'm glad to hear his, his, his uh, sharing his story, his expression about how that issue has impacted him and asking his mom all the time, why are all these people sleeping on the streets? That's a question we adults have to ask ourselves and then decide whether or not we're going to push our leaders to address the issue. But homelessness is on the rise in this country. We move on to the next question or comment. Um, hi, my name is Christian, and um, I want to know how can you help us do right in our community? How to do right in the community. How, how to help them do right. How to do right. Yes. You keep the love in your heart that you're willing to aid others, help others, and you're willing to pay a price. By pay a price, what I mean, though, brother, is that you're willing to take a risk. You're willing to go outside of what you normally do. You're willing to be unpopular sometimes among your friends when you're doing the right thing. See what I'm talking about? You understand what I'm talking about? And you're going to do the right thing, right? You keep doing the right thing. Justice, love, compassion, concern about others. We'll get more questions in the next hour of this conversation. You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0 in West Palm Beach, Florida. Please thank Brother Geraldo Reyes. Yeah. Please thank Brother Geraldo Reyes and the Coalition of Emotionally Workers. This conversation being brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. We're back with more from West Palm Beach in a moment. Welcome back to the Poverty Tour 
We're live in West Palm Beach, Florida at the Roosevelt Middle School. This is the final stop on this Poverty Tour 2.0, taking us to Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Florida. I'm Tavis Smiley. I'm Cornell West. And we're going to continue now in this hour. We've got some more time here for uh, some more questions. And then next hour, we've got some more guests. We're going to talk about food insecurity uh, in the next hour. We've referenced it a couple times already today. Uh, but uh, some more wonderful guests coming up in the final hour uh, of this uh, town hall. But for now, let's get some more questions in the few minutes I have left before this hour ends. We'll go back to some questions and comments with the audience. I'm just speaking to very well. I'm speaking Creole. Somebody traduce for me, please. He doesn't speak English very well, so I'm going to translate for him. He said there was the first black. His name was Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture. Qui était gommé avec un gros armé qui était l'armée Napoléon. Il fought against the Napoleon army. Il était le premier des noirs et le premier des blancs. And he wrote him a letter to tell him that he was the first of the blacks to the first of the whites. Je ne joue dia nous non kafou avec Haïti. He said today we in at this defining moment in history in Haiti. Comment tout noir et blanc unité tu ensemble? How the 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 best and the finest black men can unite? Pour nous faire libération ça, pour nous gagner liberté nous, légal. Is it to unite to advance the cause of liberty and freedom for all? C'est pour une raison m'inviter panélis ça en Haïti pour nous faire comment ça matrice libération. Is it I would like to invite you guys to Haiti to see exactly how we can really advance the struggle. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I've been there, been there a couple of times and always, always ready to go back to Haiti again. It's a beautiful country. Beautiful people, beautiful art. My house is full of art from Haiti, but more importantly, people, you talking about, you talking about fight back. Seriously. You talking fight. about fight back. The Haitian people are the bravest people I've ever known. So thank you for you coming know, to Haiti. We just spent the whole day with Brother Whitecliff Jean just about, what, three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. You know Whitecliff? Whitecliff. Yeah. The great artist from Haiti? Well, he's back and forth. He's back and forth. Yeah, he's back and forth. Yeah. All right. You all stay strong. Thank you very much. Hi, my yes. name is Gina. Um, I am the mother of Isis. She is 14 years old. And I just want to make a comment that as mothers and as fathers, we must understand that we are our children's first teachers. We are sending our children to school a lot of the times with nothing, not even no, no, no mental substance. There is no character building. There is no moral teachings. And there is too much for teachers to do within that little bit of time they have to teach your children. We need to get back to teaching and empowering our children. Character building, morals. They emulate what we put in front of them. Maybe we not need to start standing up as parents. President Obama said in his opening speech when he first got elected that we need to clean up our own backyards. I am in complete compliance with this, and every day I pray over my child, for my child. I pray for her teachers. Empower our children. Let's go back to being their first teachers. Share with them the history of our ancestors before we were slaves even. We did things before we were slaves, during slavery, and directly after we were freed. We have to share these things with our children and again become their first teachers. Mm. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yes, peace, sir. brothers, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm actually a teacher, so I agree 100% with the sister that just spoke uh, before uh, mm -hmm. me. And I literally work directly across the tracks at the only African-centered charter school uh, here in the state of Florida, Joseph Little and Guzu Saba Charter School, um, where we do that, we'll teach character and all that, character building and teaching about the history and culture. Uh, my question for you two brothers, though, especially dealing with poverty, um, I want to hear more about ownership with that, because one of the main ways that we can eliminate poverty, especially within our communities, is to own something in our community. Mm -hmm. And then we have the power to hire and do these other things. So I wanted to hear what you brothers had to say about that. It's a powerful question. Um, I've always believed that, um, how might I put this? I have a critique of capitalism, as does Doc, and that's another conversation for another time. Uh, we could spend hours talking about that, critiquing capitalism as we know it. Uh, but ultimately, uh, for me, the problem with capitalism is that they always get the capital and we get the ism. The racism, the sexism, the cronyism, 
the good old boyism. I say that as an entrepreneur. Um, the, I've been fortunate over the course of my career. A lot of folk know me from back in the day when my career got started on BET. I've been at this 20 years now. So if you have a certain age in this room, you, you, you saw my BET show. And of a certain age, you listened to me for 12 years on Tom Joyner every day. And, and people have followed my career for these 20 years. Um, somewhere along the way, principally after I got fired by BET, I decided that I was not going to go back on the air again unless and until I owned everything that I did. And so, long story short, for years now, for many, many years now, I own my TV show that you see on PBS every night. I own it. PBS distributes it. I own my radio show. PBS distributes it. We own Smiley and West. I mean, PRI distributes my radio show. We own Smiley and West. PRI distributes it. I own Smiley Books. So we put out my book and Iyana's book and Dr. West's book and Skip Gates's book. And, but we own Smiley Books. The Speakers Bureau that represents us to speak, we own the Speakers Bureau. So I believe in ownership. I believe in entrepreneurship. So that's, that, that's not the question. The question is how we make that happen when people don't have access to the resources, that capitalism dynamic that I raised a moment ago. So I'm all for that. I just know that it's, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult in this economy to get that kind of access. Look at it this way. If people are having difficult times trying to find work, and with those who do find work are underemployed, either you're unemployed or you're underemployed, that's a very, very serious challenge. And unfortunately, can I tell you the truth? Can I really tell you the truth? Unfortunately, this administration has not been as good on issues for small business as they should have been. Don't take my word for it. Go talk to the folk at Black Enterprise Magazine. Get them off the record and have them let you, have them tell you what they really think about what this administration has or hasn't done where small, not, we know, they, we know they did for Wall Street, but where small business is concerned. You don't believe Black Enterprise? Go to Ohio State, the Ohio State University, the Kerwin Institute. You ain't got to go. You can go online. K-I-R-W-A-N. The Kerwin Institute did a study on what the stimulus bill passed by this administration, what it really meant to small black business in America. Their conclusion, nothing ever trickled down. So there was no money that really came from that stimulus for small business. We all know that it's small business that drives the country. So we're in total agreement. You know, well, we, we have, his question, what can we do? We gotta make demands. That's why we're on this poverty tour. Whether it's poverty, whether it's, whether it's, whether it's you know, it's SBA, whether it's, you know, we, we got to, we got, the short answer is, we got to do what the gays and lesbians did. How about that? We got to do what the Jewish lobby has done. How about that? We got to do what, you know, what a whole bunch, what, what the, what Wall Street did. How about that? We got to do what the auto industry did. Now, that's what Docs and I, we understand we don't have that, we don't have that kind of access. But that's why we're on this poverty tour. That's why Doc and I keep accenting the fight back. People have to fight back. They've got to speak up. They've got to be heard. Here's the bottom line. The energy that we exhibited four years ago to get President Obama elected is the same energy you have to exhibit now to make demands on the issues that matter to your community. That's not hating on the president. You can love him, you can support him, you can vote for him, you can walk precincts, you can phone bank, but he's the president. And even though people keep saying he ain't the president of black America, he's president of all America, that's not true. He is the president of black America and the rest of America. It's not either or, it's both and. So you, you, you got to hold your friends accountable too. Sometimes you got to fight with your friends. You ever fought with your friends? I know I have. Sometimes you got to fight even with your friends. But it's a matter of holding people accountable. And that's not hating on people. It's holding them accountable. And if we want small business to grow, and small black business to grow, we got to get these impediments out the way that keep them from being successful in business. Hope that answers your question. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, brother. I want to thank you um, for being here. My name is Dina Foman, and I, my question is this. I grew up in Riviera Beach. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's one of the poorest neighborhoods in a generational uh, cycle of assistance. My mother was a crack addict. My father was an alcoholic. Um, I broke the chain and went to law school on welfare. Um, I'm a practicing attorney here, 
and I try my best to speak out on these issues and speak in schools and do as much as I possibly can to get the word out. And my question to you is can we all come together and bring this issue to light? Those um, I try to speak out because many in my community think it's a black issue or a Latino issue, right. and it is an American issue. Can we speak to that issue? Oh, well, we both salute your struggle and your eloquence. And we acknowledge on this tour that we're talking about human beings, we're talking about Americans across the board. But keep in mind, and when you rightly say, as long as there's a black face on poverty, people are less likely to take it seriously. We put a white face on poverty, it becomes a major issue. Now we know that's true, but that the assumption of course is, and we, black life has less value than white life. That's precisely what you acknowledge, I acknowledge to be the wrong thing. We want humanity to, to progress. So we have to be able to tell this truth, but tell it in such a way that it unleashes the energies to work together to do the kind of thing you've been able to do. Can you imagine if all the poor persons were able to do what you would do? What a beautiful thing. But then that requires fighting for justice because we can't be naive. There are forces in place that do not want to eliminate poverty. That's what the struggle is all about. There's forces in place that do not want to eliminate racism. They do not want to eliminate sexism. They don't want to eliminate anti-Semitism. They don't want to eliminate anti-Arab. Look at the treatment right now of our Muslim brothers and sisters as if every Muslim somehow wants to burn things down. It's a small slice that's doing that. There's one and a half billion Muslims in the world. That's a small slice that's doing that. I'm a Christian. I know I've got gangsters within the Christian tradition. <laughs> all colors but i'm still a christian and i'm critical of their gangsterism but it's that acknowledgement of us coming together that this tour is all about thank you so much right. thank you very much yes sir hi my name is chris haynes i'm a recent graduate from florida man university my question pertains to um it pertains to poverty but i heard all the discussions that's been um that you guys been talking about, but one of the major issues that's constantly being overlooked is the invisible caste system that I've currently been reading about, which is um, the new Jim Crow, basically um, the mass incarceration. And you can't get rid of uh, poverty without getting rid of mass incarceration. So my question to you, because I am currently and almost through with your book, um, um, the, um, Hope on a Hope on a Tight Rope. So um, yes, and I see how your chapter when you talk about family and it directly to me core with um, mass incarceration in a book that um, Michelle, Michelle, Michelle Alexander, Alexander yeah. right? So um, I, basically what I'm asking you is how can we make mass incarceration more visible to the invisible um, oh, yeah. um, um, concept of it? Yeah, brother, wonderful question. I was just blessed last night. One of the reasons why my voice is gone because I was with Michelle Alexander, Angela Davis in New York City talking about how do we end mass incarceration? And there is a movement now around the nation, various local branches, to end mass incarceration by one, making it visible. Everybody talks about breaking Jim Crow. There used to be Jim Crow Senior in Florida, right? What was Jim Crow in Florida? We're going to terrorize these black people. We're going to traumatize these black people. We're going to stigmatize these black people and keep them so afraid they never organized to break the back. But here come Fannie Lou, here come Martin, here come others. Straighten up. Don't be afraid. Come together. We're going to fight. We're going to resist this. Well, now we got Jim Crow's junior. The new Jim Crow, the prison system. First, you got to make, bring it to light. Michelle Alexander, Angela Davis, and others, bring it to light. Then you got to organize. And of course, it's a human question, right? All human beings. This is an unjust system. The war on drugs. 13% of young black people take drugs. 13% of white young folk take drugs. Black people, 65% of the convictions. That's racist. It's unfair. It's wrong. And if we really want to keep track of criminality, we could examine some activity on Wall Street. 
Oh, yeah. How you going to have a major financial catastrophe and no criminal activity, violation of law? How many bankers have been sent to jail? Zero. But Jamal gets caught with a crack bag. He's gone. We have to have a fair rule of law. That's part of this movement, my brother. I salute what you're doing. And I wish I had the... Uh, the, 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 but you just look, look on the internet, ending mass incarceration to become part of that movement here in Florida and other parts. But you stay strong in your work. Though. I got 20 seconds, oh, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My mission is to continue the work of Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And we want to make the will of the people visible on bills in the House of Representatives. We want to organize the fight by making the will of the people visible on bills in the House of Representatives at ppoll.org. We invite you to join us in that. If you do not think that is the way to continue the, the work of Martin Luther King today, to organize the fight through the internet by bringing the voices of poverty to Washington, D.C. on policy issues, on substantive issues, making the will of people visible, comparing it to the House vote to see which one is accurate if we're being represented by the House vote or not, if that is not the best way to continue the work of Martin Luther King today, what is? Thank you very much. I agree. I agree. We've got one more hour to go in this final stop on our Poverty Tour 2.0. We are in West Palm Beach, Florida at the Roosevelt Middle School. We'll continue with this last hour in a moment. This is being brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. We're back in a moment.
Welcome back to the Poverty Tour 2.0. We are in West Palm Beach, Florida at Roosevelt Middle School. And we are down to the last hour, last hour. of the last day. The last day. Of the Poverty Tour 2.0. 2.0. The last hour of the last day. We started in Ohio, in case you just tuned in. Started in Ohio, then went to Virginia, then to Pennsylvania, and we are wrapping things here in the state of Florida. And we've had a chance over this uh, last week traveling to talk to all kinds of people about all kinds of issues relative to poverty, how to reduce it, how to cut it in half, and ultimately how to eradicate it in the richest nation in the world. And there are a number of stats that we found ourselves citing um, repeatedly over the course of uh, this tour. Uh, and for that matter, the work we've done over the last few years trying to push this issue a little higher on the American agenda. And one of those uh, statistics comes courtesy of the uh, Agriculture Department um, that, again, informs us mm -hmm. that in America, 50 million people tonight will go to bed not having had enough food. These are numbers from the Agriculture Department. 50 million go to bed tonight not having had enough food. Nine million of that 50 million are children. Um, so put another way, the younger you are in America, the more likely you are to be poor. The younger you are in America, the more likely you are to be poor. Something is wrong in this country when too many children are forced to surrender their life's chances before they ever know their life's choices. That's what we're up against in this country. And that's why this issue of poverty is so very, very important. I want to introduce three people now to talk about the work that they're doing to combat poverty in America. And it's fascinating for me because this tour started with the support of the AARP Foundation. We know certainly here in Florida and all across the country that seniors are being put in a hard way um, by this great recession uh, and by the ongoing issue of poverty in America. There are too many seniors who are forced these days to make choices between food and medicine. So while we talk about the, the impact that poverty is having on the young, That's right. and while we sit in a middle school looking at hundreds of young people who've been here for these three hours, uh, we have not talked about directly the impact that poverty is having on seniors in America, um, even though we're in the state of Florida, which has a very good, obviously, senior population. I say all that to say that this tour has been made possible in part by the generous support and contribution of the AARP Foundation. Um, and they're so busy doing their work, and we've been so busy running around, that it isn't until the last stop, <laughs> on the last day, in the last hour, that we get a chance to publicly thank the AARP yeah. uh, and the AARP Foundation for the work that they're doing to combat poverty in this country by having one of their top leaders join us in this conversation. So please thank her, one, for being here and for supporting this tour from the AARP, the manager of state operations here in Florida. Please welcome Yolanda Rodriguez. Thank you, thank you. Yolanda, good to have you here. Uh, we're also pleased to have Peggy Miller, who's the executive director of Broward Meals on Wheels. Please welcome Peggy to the conversation. And finally, please welcome Hayward Wetzel, who's the founding board chair of Meals on Wheels of the Palm Beaches. Mr. Wetzel, good to have you here. Welcome him as well. Yolanda, let me start with you again. Dr. Wetzel and I both want to express our sincere appreciation Absolutely. Um, for the support that the ARP Foundation uh, has given to make this uh, tour possible. They've supported us in the past, and they came back to support us again this time. I don't need to color this question too much, uh, but we all know um, that poverty is run amok in this country, but it is having a particular impact, particular effect on the nation's seniors. So I don't need to go any deeper than that. Take, t take it away. Thank you so much. Um, you're absolutely right, Tavis. Uh, in this downturn of economy, seniors are really feeling the brunt of what uh, it means to be able to survive. Uh, Florida used to be the draw for many seniors across the country to come and retire in the state of Florida, but the state of Florida is not so affordable anymore for our seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, we realize that um, we, we have to be a champion for our seniors. ARP has always stood for making sure that seniors have access to health care when they're older and that they have uh, financial security. 
And we just believe that if you get sick, you shouldn't go broke uh, trying to survive in this world, especially in the United States. And now we're uh, looking at the alarming issue of hunger among seniors. And we know that every day, 9 million people 50 years of age and older go to, go to sleep without enough food on the table. And that's why we are uh, launching our community conversations throughout the country and especially in the state of Florida because we know that the next president and the next group that goes to Congress will be deciding really important issues for us as it relates to Medicare and Social Security. In the state of Florida, we've got millions of people depending on Social Security as their only source of income every month. We know that the average Social Security benefit for seniors is $1,100 a month. $1,100 a month is not a lot of money if you are paying for housing, you're paying for medication, you're paying for um, electricity, you're paying just to be able to survive. And um, when we look at this and we hear about some reforms up in Washington being discussed about curtailing Medicare and Social Security, we get nervous. And we will continue to champion these causes because to think that people would have to survive before below $1,100 a month in the state of Florida is alarming to us. We know that Social Security was a signature piece of legislation that right now it is lifting particularly Hispanic and African Americans out of poverty. And uh, we will be watching closely and we want people not to listen to the sound bouts on TV and not to get caught up in the rhetoric, but when you get the opportunity to meet someone who wants to court you for your vote, you ask the right questions. What are you going to do to strengthen Medicare? What are you going to do to strengthen Social Security? What are you going to do to make sure that seniors don't go hungry at night and that you continue to be a champion for so many older people in our country? What, what is, I'm just curious because we all know following this campaign that the debate about Medicare and Medicaid is real. Um, it's going to be a centerpiece, I suspect, of these debates that are upcoming. Um, I don't mean to make you political, but I am curious, um, given what AARP does and who it represents, what the, what the organization is saying about this debate about Medicare. What we are saying is, is that um, there's a lot of proposals being uh, discussed, and we want people to have the answers. And on www.aarp.org, we've got an entire listing of all solutions being proposed legislatively and policy-wise. We are not championing anything right now. We're just saying, you know, we need to know what is really being discussed so that we can make informed decisions because something will come out of this. We don't know what at this point. And therefore, we're encouraging people to stay up to date, get the facts, check the facts, and um, find out as much as they can because these are crucial decisions to the independence of seniors across the country. But the, 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 the AARP, though, has not taken a position on whether or not vouchers are the way to go? We have not taken a position at this point, no, sir. We have said that um, we believe that the issues facing the seniors in this country in terms of economic independence, hunger, all of that, they're not Republican issues, they're de not Democratic issues, and an, it's an American quality of life issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's move to our dear sister Peggy talking about uh, food. Uh, we've noted before 50 million going to bed with not enough food, nine million precious children, all colors, not enough food. Can you characterize the food situation and the challenges you have here under your leadership, your organization? We serve approximately 10,000 seniors in Broward on an annual basis, 1.5 million meals, and that's not enough. Um, the Meals and Wheels Association of America published some studies a few years ago that showed that one in nine seniors are at risk for hunger. That's now changed to one in six. And when you take the math, just in Broward County, that means there's about 40,000 more that are at risk wow. or wow. hungry in Broward. Wow. And we don't have the finances ever to, to support that, even though we can provide two meals a day for $5. Yeah. So um, it's, it's scary to even want to find the 40,000 because what do you do with them once you find them? We have created all kinds of services in our area for not having a waiting list. So we have shopping, we have paid, we have all kinds of alternatives. But if I got 40,000 tomorrow, you don't have the resources for that. Um, you don't have the staffing for that. You don't have the capability for that. That's a lot of people. So, so what, what do you think is happening to the other 30 that you're not serving? Exactly. 
I what, don't know. What's, what's happening to them? They are choosing between drugs and food again. When I got out of graduate school a long time ago, that was the conversation, and it, I thought it went away, and here we are again. So you have a lot of people that are not taking the medications they need. So you have sicker people that are going in and out of hospitals. We're going to see another crisis very soon when the, um, the Balanced Budget Act goes in mm. and the sequestration comes. The, au the automatic seven. cuts. The automatic cuts. By mm. the time we're told that by the time it trickles down to my level, it'll be a 15 to 20 percent cut. That's a lot of money. Mm. When you look at um, the affordability of the Health Care Act, where the hospitals and the nursing homes are going to start being fined for recidivism, how do you serve all those? Um, we are hoping that the hospitals and everybody will start partnering with us to, to make that stop because there are programs that we have on our level that will provide help to seniors in the home that won't go through home health um, that will help some of that um, for, you know, like prescription meds and how do they get them and who delivers them and how do they take them and how, what food do you eat with them and not. Um, there, this is a huge, huge issue. It's not just hunger. It's, it's poverty. It's yeah, economics. Yeah, yeah. It's what do you do? You're on a limited income. You're not, you know, at 90 years old, you're not necessarily, well, there are some, but you're not necessarily going out to work. Uh, how, do you make this, how do you make this happen? And now you're going to take Social Security and, you know, like Yolanda said, $1,100 a month. Can anybody here do that? I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Hey, wait, one of the things that... Um, happen so often in our in our political process the campaign process more exactly um, is that one side or the other gets accused of scaring seniors mm -hmm. you know and, and it works I've seen it happen both ways as you have in your long and distinguished career uh, but what say you about this debate happening now where people are alleging that certain people are scaring seniors D do you see this debate being used as a scare tactic or is this debate a real debate that we need to be having well, I, I, I absolutely think there are a lot of scare tactics that are being used in this campaign. You got to go on that mic. Just, you got to almost talk right into that thing. Put your mouth almost. Yeah. I definitely there think that there are a lot of uh, scare tactics that are being tossed around in this campaign. But underlying that, there are some real issues as well, and it's hard to really sort through. Um, I wanted to just uh, comment a little bit on our Meals on Wheels organization. Uh, we are Meals on Wheels of the Palm Beaches, and Travis, as you pointed out, uh, there are nine million children in this country that go to bed hungry, and there are almost as many senior citizens that are um, on the brink of being hungry. There are 8.5 million senior citizens in, with, that are threatened by hunger today. And that's why our organization was started. We are, we are um, we're organized to fight senior hunger in America. Mm. And um, our organization in Palm Beach County is a new organization. We have um, only been around for two years. And before that, amazingly, there was not a Meals on Wheels organization in this county, despite mm. the very high percentage of senior citizens that we have. So we have had an enormous job to do, and, and I guess one of the things I would like to ask today um, it, it, that is that if you know someone who is homebound and needs food, we would like to know about it. And we are easy to reach. Um, we're on the internet with a website. We have a phone number, and I'm here. And if there is someone that you are aware of, that's why we were started. The other thing I'd like to, to ask is for volunteers. Our organization is a nonprofit organization with no government funding. All of our funding comes from donations and from grants, and all of our staffing, with the exception of two people, are volunteers. Um, so if you know of someone who needs our services or if you know of anyone who would like to help, we really welcome that. I was wondering about the role of the churches or religious institutions in supporting the kind of wonderful work that, that, that you do. Churches what, what definitely would... play a part, and some of our, our best volunteers have come from churches, and some of our financial supporters have also come from churches. But we're not church affiliated. We are a, a nonprofit organization, and we work with everybody. Oh, sure. 
Can you say something? The about, about best the quote that always stays with me is that there's hunger in America, not because of a lack of food, but because of a lack of leadership. Um, there are solutions to this. We are the richest country in the world, and we have people going to bed hungry. It's not because the food's not here. The food's here. It's how do you get it down to where it needs to go? How do you get it paid for? How do you get people to understand that um, comments such as um, it's their fault for not having prepared for their retirement? Mm -hmm. I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, retirement for me is a very, very long way away financially. Um, and that was the sole response to an op-ed that I had in the Sun Sentinel with Enid Borden from the Meals on Wheels Association of America. Mm -hmm. That was the sole response. Wow. Why didn't they pr plan better? How do you plan for this? You know, we are all, every single one in this room, we are all one stroke, one heart attack, one really bad car accident away That's right. from needing somebody's help. And why are we so willing to stay in our own little cubicles and deny that? You know, we are not independently self-sufficient. Elders are the, the glue that holds us all together. As Dr. William Thomas said, they are the genius, emotional geniuses of this country and of this world. And yet we are willing to say they're useless. They're, uh, you know, uh, what do they call, what one radio commentary made a long time, the Q-tips and no CMs and people who make right turns from left lanes and what good are they? And I'm like, really? These are your grandparents you're talking about. Um, how do, you, how do you have a country that is growing older by the day? We will have, I think in the next five years, if the statistic is right, the oldest, there will be more old people than there will be young people in the world mm -hmm. for the first time in our history. I'm, yet, I'm, I'm glad you raised it. I gotta take a break, Ilana, mm -hmm. but I want, this is Peggy talking now, but when we come back from this break, I wanna come right to you. Thank uh, you. Since you're with the AARP and address that issue. That's exactly where I was going. So Peggy Very must good. be a mind reader. Because one of the, if, 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 we think, if we think we're being challenged now, just imagine that thanks to technology and to science, right. people, are, people are living longer. And some of us just t taking better care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't want to you know, disregard people who are wanting to live long lives and wanting to be healthy in old age. But Americans are living longer is the bottom line. And if we think we're being challenged by this crisis now, what happens, Yolanda, when the numbers of seniors in this company exponentially expands? How do we navigate that? You're listening to the Poverty Tour 2.0. We're at Roosevelt Middle School in West Palm Beach. We're down to, I guess, the last half hour almost of what has been a wonderful tour trying to raise the issue of poverty in this country. We'll continue in a moment. This is being brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. to the Poverty Tour 2.0 one last time for the Roosevelt Middle School Marching Band. Marching band. One more time, y'all. Magnificent. Sound is so good. They've been here. So good. And Mr. Band Director, give me your name again. David Beal. David Beal. Let's give Brother David. Brother David. Brother David. Brother David. Round of applause. <laughs> these young folk have, uh, have been here all day for three hours playing in these commercial break interludes and switching of the guests in and out at this table up here. 
So we thank all these young persons. Give them some more love one more time as they walk off. We want to thank them one more time. The Roosevelt Middle School Marching Band. And Brother David, their leader. We thank them. In case you've just tuned in, I'm Tabby Smiley. I'm Cornell West. Uh, what's, left, uh, what's left of your voice, what's at least? Left what's voice? left of you? Uh, we are in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, this is the last stop on what has been a glorious, although we wish we were touring under different circumstances. Um, this, this bell has got to be rung. This drum has got to be beaten. Pick your metaphor. Somehow we got to get the American people to focus in on the fact that poverty is the moral and spiritual issue of our time. It's threatening our very democracy. It is now a matter of national security. And we've been traveling the country trying to push this agenda, this issue forward as we um, uh, move closer to these presidential debates and beyond. How do we get the next president of the United States to call a White House conference on the eradication of poverty, to bring together all the experts, and to craft a bipartisan plan to reduce poverty in half, cut it in half in America in 10 years, which can be done, and to alleviate it in 25. Other nations have done similarly. After the Johnson War on Poverty, that's President Lyndon Johnson, we reduced poverty significantly in this country. Mm -hmm. As we keep saying, this is not a skill problem, it's a will problem. Do we have the will to make poverty eradication a priority in this country? There's nothing that America decides it wants to do that it doesn't get done. We will print money if we want to do certain things that we didn't have, namely things like war. And Dr. King once said, as you all know, that war is the enemy of the poor. Been a lot of, lot of rumorings this week about war and whether or not we're about to get engaged in another conflict uh, in the Middle East. War is the enemy of the poor. Every time we go to war, it's poor people who suffer. Just more resources it's being spent abroad um, when we have this great need here at home. So this issue is already important, and my sense is, and Doc's sense is, that it's going to become more important in the coming days and weeks and months and years. And speaking of which, Yolanda, Yolanda Rodriguez, the manager of state operations for AARP, their foundation helped sponsor this tour. Peggy was making the point before the break that people are living longer. That's the bottom line. And if we think we're being challenged by these issues now, not enough resources for the population, not enough jobs for the population, not enough jobs with a living wage for the population, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, not enough food for people to eat. If we think we're being challenged now, as we live longer, how are we going to navigate this situation? Tavis, I have to tell you that I have great faith in the United States. Just as Martin Luther King once said, faith is defined as taking the first step even if you don't see the entire staircase. And the truth of the matter is, is that um, ARP Foundation, when it began through its research looking at the magnitude of the problem of poverty in this country, said, you know what, we need to make this an awareness issue. We need to tell people how critical it has become in our country and that we're at a tipping point. So to that end, ARP started a couple of years ago in 2011 uh, a multi-year campaign through NASCAR. It, um, uh, made an agreement with four-time NASCAR winner um, Jeff Gordon to be able to bring awareness to another whole side uh, sector of the uh, population that has no idea what's going on. But through that popularity and those Daytona races and NASCAR races throughout the country, we are talking about hunger in an unusual venue and getting attention. We are having people contribute financially to the cause ARP um, doesn't want to just give grants to local community to buy food. We want to give grants to find solutions on a long-term basis to change the community to have it come together. Just as we have that wonderful refrain that says it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to maintain the quality of life for our elder citizens. And so we are looking at ways to continue to raise awareness. We are looking at ways to enhance food distribution. We are helping people with their SNAP enrollment if they need it and don't know how to go about it. And we are um, in a multi-year campaign to make sure that our communities are prepared at least with the numbers because the beginning of a solution is defining the problem. And we have the numbers, we know what needs to be done, and now we need partners to get the work done on the ground. Mm. Well, we salute each and every one of you for being such forces for good both here in this community, in this state, and in this nation and world. 
We're going to uh, turn now to uh, questions, and please ask questions, not simply to Brother Tavis and myself, but also our three wonderful fellow citizens and brother and two sisters. Go Your ahead. questions or comments, we're ready for them. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Terry, Dr. West, Mr. Smiley. Grateful to have you here, both inspirational men. Um, I work with a very unique population of men. Um, I took up this cause three years ago. Uh, I work with men that, that are recently released from prison, the reentry population. Um, they are a very unique entity in terms of poverty. They meet all of the criteria, you know, education, homelessness, et cetera. Um, I love your energy. I love the, the, the theological debates that you get into. Um, my, my simple question is this. Uh, in our society, do you fundamentally believe that um, capitalism is not a zero-sum game, meaning that poverty is not a direct function of capitalism? And if it is not, how do we win? Um, I, 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 and I mean that in the most practical sense because I do, I work with these men, I understand their struggles, I understand the marks that are on the back, how we're perceived, but in, in spite of, we, we do go on and press forward, we do make it our mission to, to engage and, and try to become, and help them become the leaders of tomorrow, even given their, their uh, lack of attributes. But I, I, I see you guys get, you know, attacked all the time um, for being kind of out, out of touch with reality, not, not in the, the substantive culture of America. And I guess, and I reiterate my question again, is it, is it truly not a zero-sum game? Is it a way that capitalism can function yeah, yeah. and mm. still address poverty? Thank you. Yeah, no, indeed. And I salute your spirit and the work that you are doing. But as I said before, we would go back to 1955 and somebody says, we're going to break the back of Jim Crow in Florida. What would most people say? You, you got the chance of a snowball in hell. Don't you know how deeply entrenched this system is? You got to cut against the grain. No, he's a crazy Negro. She's a crazy Negro. She's going to take a risk. She's willing to die because she loves people. And what happens? That becomes contagious. In 10, 15 years, all of a sudden, old style Jim Crow in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, waning away. Now, of course, we know that's not the end of the story, right? Poverty's still around. Racism still around, but that's progress. And right now with the new Jim Crow, we're talking about the issue of awareness that our brother was saying. Make, you have to bring it to the awareness. Explain to the people why the new Jim Crow is something that is in, in, in no way an integral part of American democracy and even certain forms of capitalism. Because I have my critique of capitalism, but you know what? They've got capitalism in Finland and they got 2% poverty. We got capitalism in America, we got 16% poverty, 40% poverty among our red brothers and sisters, 30 some percent for black, black and brown. So even when we talk about capitalism, we can't just use abstractions. It's what particular kind of capitalism are we talking about? Mm -hmm. If it's a capitalism that leads toward more cold-heartedness and mean-spiritedness, then it's gonna be one in which we have higher levels of poverty. If we can generate a moral and spiritual transformation and have a generousness and a connectedness to others, then we can still bring down the rates. And same is true in terms of what I call breaking the back of the new Jim Crow. Acknowledging the humanity of those. All of us have made mistakes. And see, I speak as a Christian, which means I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivity. <laughs> So when somebody says, oh, that's a gangster over there, I understand. I still love them. They can change because I changed. And if you change and other folk need to change, then we all can be in this together and have a possibility of changing our communities and our world. And that's the kind of spirit that I discerned in your remarks, and I, was, and I, and I appreciate that. Before I go, thank you for your question. Before I go back to the line, I want to come to Yolanda right quick because the brother's question made me think of something. With, with the, with the reentry community that he's, that he's working with. Um, there are so many seniors who are doing something right now that they did not expect to be doing. Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going mm -hmm. with this. I, I do because, believe. Because their sons and their daughters found themselves wrestling with a particular demon or issue, and there are a variety of those. They are now taking care of grandkids, not taking care of raising. That's correct. Grandkids that they never expected to be raising. 
uh, and it's happening to parents of color all across the country. Um, so what say you about um, the struggle that many of these seniors are already having to make it on their own, and now they have in their households grandkids who they love, and because they love, they're not going to let them be sent to foster homes. They're going to bring them in, but now they got a double struggle, trying to make it on their own and raise these grandkids they didn't expect to be raising. How does that work? Tavis, uh, you're so, you have your pulse on America. You know what's going out there. Um, and I, what I can share with you is, is that in my own home, that's happening. Not because my um, younger sister is struggling with a demon, but she has to work and she's a single mom. And so my parents, in their late 70s, are raising and helping take care of my little two-year-old niece. And that happens in so many families across America. But the human spirit and family has an incredible way of adapting and adapting and adapting. And even if they have less, to make sure that the next generation has what they need. So I see family caregiving as a huge issue. Um, I also know that the problem with caregiving is that over time, that person you're taking care of is going to be fine, but you're falling apart. And so ARP has also launched an awareness campaign with the Ad Council. Um, I, it's a uh, public service announcement that shows the image of most people. The adult daughter driving their mother or elderly father to the doctor, and they're at a stop sign, and they just scream. They scream in frustration. They scream in powerlessness. They scream because they need an outlet. It is frustrating to take care of someone time, day in and day out, without any light at the end of the tunnel and without the resources you need. So ARP is all about equipping people to give them the tools and the resources we have. We have wonderful tools. We have tools on how to prepare to become a caregiver. We have the ability to connect people in the community to their local senior centers, to counselors, to all kinds of services to give them the support they need to get through that day-to-day -day struggle. This, this is another conversation, but just again, to just <laughs> underscore what a challenge it is and why poverty is just engulfing so many people. It's not just grandparents taking care of grandkids. It's baby boomers now living longer, taking care of their parents mm -hmm. who are living longer. Dr. West just lost his grandmother not long ago. In his case, she lived to be 97? 97 years 97. old. 97, so she lived a long God life. Bless her. God bless her. God her. God bless T. Rowe, T. Rowe. Miss your grandma, miss your grandma. Yeah, so she lived to be 97, but his mother, his mother who is 80, was taking care of her 97-year-old mother. Mm -hmm. So I saw him, I saw his family go through that. In my own family, my grandmother, Big Mama, we called her, lived to be 90, and my mother was taking care of Big Mama. Right. And she cried, I'd never forget as long as I live, the day my mother called me, and she cried, and she cried. It wasn't just crying, she was wailing this day. And of course, whenever you hear your mama cry, it breaks you up. Something, oh, yeah. you, know, you hear your mama going through that, it's gonna move you. My mother was wailing on the phone, and she needed to talk to me because she didn't have any choice. My grandmother made my mother promise her that whatever happened to her, she would not put her in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. And it's to the credit of so many families Absolutely. that so many seniors do not end up in nursing homes. My nursing. mother, my grandmother said to my mother, do Joyce, my mother's name is Joyce. Big mama said, Joyce, whatever you do, do not put me in a nursing home. I do not want to go in a nursing home. And that's not to demonize nursing homes. There are a lot of good ones out there. Mm -hmm. um, but she didn't want to go. And my mother, to your point, Yolanda, was taking care of my grandmother on her own. That one day my mother threw her back out. That's right. Mm -hmm. Trying to get my grandmother to the restroom. So she throws her back out. And so now I got a, a grandmother who is sick and a mother who's on her back. Now I got to fly to Indiana from Los Angeles to figure out how to work all this out. Mm -hmm. So we ultimately had to put her in a, in a nursing home. Um, but I know the struggle that families deal with trying to take care of grandkids or trying to take care of parents who are living longer. And all that does is increase. One of the reasons why my grandmother didn't go to a, a nursing home sooner, and I didn't know the details about it, was his money. My mother's like, Tavis, I, you know, I don't want us to spend, yeah, I appreciate your generosity, Tavis, but I don't want us to spend that kind of money when I can give mama better care in the home and know she's being turned over and cleaned. And I, I want, I, I, she's my mother, I don't have a problem doing that. And I know however well they do the job down there. They're not going to do as well as I do it because they don't love mama like I love her. And I understood all that, but it got to a point you couldn't do it anymore. That's so right. I'm just raising the point that these are issues right. that make trying to navigate your way through this economy 
and through poverty even more difficult for seniors. So enough said. Yes, ma'am, your question or comment. Thank you again for coming. My name is Beverly Duquois, and I relocated here to Florida because of the economy. And I had to bring my son and move into my mother's home and walk away from my home. I couldn't get a job. I was overqualified. I used to work for the federal government as an event coordinator. I eventually went back to school, and I became a chef. Meanwhile, I've been the volunteer chef and coordinator at St. Patrick's Soup Kitchen. We feed not just the hungry, we also feed the homeless. The outreach program in that community has grown to the point that I'm feeding yesterday, only once a week I can do it because it's volunteer, it's a nonprofit, 195 people in three hours. There is no doubt we have a problem. And all I'm saying is if you know who your neighbors are who don't have a job, just put one extra piece of chicken in the pot for them. Don't tell them you're bringing them food, just give it to them. When you go to the grocery and you get that two for one bread, just take the extra bread and take it to Sister Joy down the street because she's got four babies in the house. Stop throwing away the food, stop wasting it. We each can just do a little bit and all the drops add up and then we got this big bucket. But we have a serious problem. The large restaurants will not give us the food. The Sam's Clubs, they're all afraid of being sued. They're not going to give it to us. But there are lots of people out there that need to be fed. It is the fundamental right of a human being to be fed. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very powerful. much. Appreciate it. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Wonderful, wonderful work you're doing. Yes, much sir. honor and respect to you, Dr. West. Um, much deference to my fraternity brother, Tavis Smiley. Will the members of the grand Thank fraternity you. of Kappa Alpha Psi just stand up and show Tavis Smiley we support him? Members of Kappa Alpha Psi. Kappa's in the house. Kappa's in the house. Yo, yo, yo. Thank Kappa's you. Kappa's in the house. Uh, my Ooh. question is actually in the spirit of youth empowerment. Um, I know something that was very instrumental in the development of my leadership coming up in high school. I'm about to date myself as Teen Summit. It was a, a syndicated show that was on BET. Mm -hmm. It inspired me and it carried on through college. And now I serve as a senior leader at, bank, uh, at a major financial institution. Um, I want to know what can you do to leverage your resources, your talents, your experience, your expertise, or even your network to promote a platform like that for today's youth mm -hmm. to inspire leadership and empowerment in today's youth. Even syndicator or maybe give us some best practices that we can probably do something um, locally here in West Palm Beach. You know, for 13 years, it's been the Tavis Smiley Foundation. Mm -hmm. Meets every summer for one week. 500 young people shaped to be leaders, exposed to legacies of Martin King and Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer and all of those folk who learn how to fight and bear witness so they connect to the best of their history. Mm -hmm. And we were just in Philadelphia yesterday the youngest person elected to the state house in Pennsylvania, name is Jordan Harris, product of the Tavis Smiley Foundation. Oh, nice. Amen. 23 years old, and that's just one example. So that in that sense, he got 13 years already of rich experience of the wonderful kind of work you're talking about. And the same is true in terms of the mentoring program of our sororities, beginning with AKA, just because again, my mama's one. Now, oh, shout out indeed, Sister Monica, again, indeed, indeed. But, but this is also true for our Delta sisters and others doing wonderful work, wonderful work. Now, I'm an Alpha brother, we're doing wonderful work, campus too, but also the brothers and sisters on the block who are still struggling and trying to be forces for good. I just wish we had prophetic churches that would step forward with power, that would have much stronger prison ministries and food ministries, then they're building funds and they CEO pastors with their friends. I would only add, I'd only add two things. Number one, thanks to all the Kappa brothers who are here. I appreciate that love, number one. Number two, um, I, we, we were in New York last night, as Dr. West said. We, we've been together on this tour for however many days we've been out here. We've been, we've been everywhere. But we got to New York last night and Doc went to Riverside to uh, be a part of the conversation about mass incarceration. I went to a meeting with a new television network, a major network, with a lot of money behind it that's being geared toward young, young people. Good. And they're specifically interested 
in young people being empowered with information. So I'll tell you more about it when the show's over with, but Absolutely. if you guys are doing any work and you want to get involved with them, I'll tell you about it. There's new TV network on this coming on to do just that. So there, there's some folks doing some work. We'll talk about it, though. All right, most definitely. Good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. You're listening to The Poverty Tour 2.0 from Roosevelt Middle School in West Palm Beach. We're back with one final segment in just a moment. This is brought to you by Pacifica and Native Voice One. Welcome back to the Poverty Tour 2.0. I'm Tavis Smiley. I'm Cornell West. And this is the last stop on uh, what's been, again, a wonderful journey around the country, this time battleground states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Florida, trying to get the issue of poverty um, some more traction uh, in the richest nation in the world. So our last segment, we got a few, uh, uh, some time for a few more questions, and we love doing these town halls and hearing from everyday people, so, sir, it's on you. Hi, my name is uh, Malcolm Scott. Um, I actually live here in Florida. Uh, I actually graduated from uh, Loyola University in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was very uh, privileged with my mother is in the stands, Ms. Rita Scott. But um, what I tend to uh, want to look at is see the empowerment of youth. And um, Dr. West, you really inspired me just how you interact with the kids, especially with the drums. But I coach basketball. I try to be involved. But what I want to see more is that our youth is where it starts. What I believe is they have the education to understand and realize what they can do to change. I think a lot of things besides even poverty, but more aspects of the world can be changed. But my question is how, how do we influence that education to be ingrained in their minds because so many times they get sidelined and sidetracked and things in their streets or in their community take them into another spectrum that they believe is better, but it's not. So how can we push education to any level to be um, their forefront, what they need to work for? Yeah, that's a powerful question, oh brother. Your beloved mother has much to be proud of. She's quite eloquent and compassionate. I think that even when we try to embrace our youth, we must recognize there's forces outside that's trying to push them in the wrong direction. They got a mass culture coming at them. They got this bubblegum music. You know, these songs with seven words played 11 times with no substance, no content at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all about stimulating their bodies and titillating their bodies. They ain't got nothing to do with stirring their souls. So how do we connect them to a tradition of soul stirs, of music, music that really affects their backbone? We need backbone music. He said, the real stuff, the give me something real stuff that will sustain you in the midst of your crisis. And the only way to do that is what you're doing. We have to reach out and let them know they come from a great people, great tradition, and ways in which they can sustain themselves without falling into those pits that we know are there, oftentimes linked to the larger forces over which we have little, little control. We need a renaissance a renaissance of compassion, a renaissance of focusing on the youth, 
renaissance of focusing on the old, a renaissance of focusing on the least of these, the vulnerable and the weak. We've been too obsessed with the successful, fashionable, rich, and famous. Mm -hmm. Even our young people obsessed with celebrities. What have celebrities actually done for you in terms of their courage? All they, oftentimes they're just peacocks. They're just peacocks. I'm not, I love success, but it's empty if it doesn't have a connection to service to others, a connection to helping others out. That's what's so wonderful about this leader we have here. Uh, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, Peggy and Hayward, right quick. Um, we were talking earlier about the fact that the numbers of people that you serve uh, with regard to these food programs you see growing exponentially. What I didn't ask, and I'm curious now, is to whether or not there's a difference in the profile. Are you seeing a different kind of person that you're serving? Are you seeing people who look a little awkward standing in a food line? You, you know I'm getting at that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who have um, had successful careers and had that stroke and lost it all. Um, people who were in a car accident that they didn't cause and lost it all. Yolanda referenced, you know, spending all your money on medical care. That's, that's why I say the statement. It's one stroke, one heart attack, one car accident away. We're all there. You, I don't care how much money you have. You know, look at a half of these football players that make millions and millions and millions and they're bankrupt. Really? Um, you know, it's, it's personal. It's um, how you manage your own life. I want to address, um, ma'am, um, about the restaurant thing. And since we're in a middle school, this is even better. The Jack Davis Act was passed many years ago by a 12-year-old and he got it through the legislative of Florida that the restaurants can donate without the liability. So I encourage you to look that act up and then go back to the BJ's and whatever, okay? And because they can, and so can the restaurants. All of the food banks can do that. So it's a tw it was a 12-year-old. Go ahead and look it up. So there are kids out there that can do it. That's a sideline to your question, but no, I appreciate that. I'm glad, <laughs> glad you said that. Glad you said that. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Um, you're get, look, commend, get, get right, get right I on that commend, mic. I commend all of you for, for being here. And everyone is struggling trying to bring forward a fact. Poverty. No one believes it. A lot of people simply do not believe that kids are hungry or elderly are hungry. I have a solution. Let's ask the kids. Let's ask them, how many kids are hungry? Why not? Why can't we ask our kids in class how many are hungry? Well, because we don't want to single anyone out. So yes, to, yes, to, yes, yes, very, to very quickly, anonymous polling. We can anonymously poll our kids every day. It should be a regular part of class. Instead of singling them out, do you or don't you know a question individually? I can ask how many kids did their homework, and I'll get a response from the class as a percentage poll. It's called anonymous polling. You flip a coin, the kid answers yes if it's heads, and he answers the truth if it's tails. So if I ask you a sensitive question, you might respond yes or no, but I can't tell from your response whether you're responding to the question or whether you're responding to the result of your toss. Now what this means is, and I think this is why it's very important to you, you're trying to light fires under people and people aren't believing you. <clears throat> people have hearts already. We already want to do things. I think it's our eyes that are lacking, okay? I think when people hear, oh, one out of five kids are criminally victimized. You talked about people who can't defend themselves. Even an elderly person <clears throat> usually has more wherewithal. They know who to call or someone to call. They have someone to call. Kids, they have no one. If they're in crisis, the statistics are one out of five are criminally attacked by 18. Criminally means it's met a criminal definition. You can be taken to jail for doing something. You know, most of us as parents we get upset way before it reaches criminality. So if it's one out of five, there was the Million Father March. 200,000 fathers of the Million Father March should be up in arms about the one out of five statistic. So we hear these statistics and they go in one ear out the other. It's like stepping over dead bodies. We've all seen that black grainy video of a store being robbed and this woman is reaching, stepping over a dead body to get to her coffee. And we're all looked down on that person. How dare she step over a dying person for her coffee? We do that every time we hear the statistic of one in five kids abused, and we let it go in one ear and out the other. Same thing with poverty. See, we we, we try to put a human face on it, so human, then it's difficult the to push it. Every aside. morning, it should be a part of class. We talk about inclusion. If I'm overly let, let, smart... Let, 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 me, let me jump in right quick, though. So I'm, I'm just trying to follow your logic. 
So kids come to the classroom, every morning you want to ask them if they're hungry, half the class says yes, then what? Then I want to look you and their parents in the eye and say, it's not some other kids that are hungry. I want to go to these people here in this, this room and say, half of your kids are hungry, and I want to jump up and down and scream. I can't scream quite as much because it's like, well, they might be hungry, or it's some other kids, or it's the statistics in a paper, okay? I think this individualizes. I think it would be very powerful. Got it. Thank you for your comment. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Hi there. Whoa. Uh, my name is Justin, and I've been a political and protest organizer since I was 12, and uh, I actually had the honor of organizing the event that you spoke at Professor West at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, the yeah, trial of where Goldman was that? Sachs. In, in, here in Florida? No, 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 in New York. I quit my job uh, oh, on September yeah. 24th and went to New York to do that. Um, my question to you is how can you organize activists? There are so many issues that have been you know, brought up at this forum and going on in our country. How do you get people to put aside the one the issue that they're focusing on and stand in solidarity with someone else so that way you know, next week those other people will stand in solidarity with them? Mm -hmm. Appreciate the question and your work. I was thinking that was part of Occupy Tallahassee, too. We had a good time in Tallahassee, but of course, Occupy Wall Street there in New York has been a good time. But I think what we need to have is, is what I'd call revolutionary love, a militant tenderness, and a subversive sweetness. <laughs> That's what we need. We need to let folk know that we're motivated by a deep compassion and therefore we're concerned about everyone's suffering. This isn't a special interest affair. It's a human affair. By militant tenderness, I mean that we want to be tender with each other when we disagree, because we are going to disagree. But we can have deeper agreements that holds us together. And by subversive sweetness, I mean a recognition that we say things that try to enable and empower us that leads toward a fundamental transformation of the world in which, in which we live. And of course, that's one of the challenges of the Occupy movement. It was magnificent coming back in various forms, but how do you hold it together? You need that kind of common vision with those characteristics that allow us to acknowledge various issues, but still a common cause. Got three minutes to go here. I'm going to get these last two questions in in three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm here for my goddaughter, Jordana Anderson, and my thought, and I want you also to comment on what I have to say, is the apathy or the unconcern of the youth today, and more importantly, the, the lowering of the bar or the acceptance, the blind acceptance of adults to the applauding of mediocrity, basically, mm -hmm. and how our, when I was a kid and I was even in my church, just doing the, uh, a simple thing as doing an Easter speech or a Christmas speech, it was a bar that was set. You know, I had to say it over and over until I said it correctly. I had to, I had to, I had to say it over and over. I had to say it loudly. I had to speak correct English. But the lowering of the bar for our youth today, where we just accept whatever they offer, whatever they do, wherever they say, we just automatically applaud the effort and we, we don't set the bar high enough for them. Can you speak at that? And, and also, and, it, and for our kids also, it, it's not just for us setting the bar for them, but for them to set the bar for themselves. There has to be a, a, a self-responsibility. I need to take the hard class. Kids, we're, this is all for you, and we can lead you to the water, but we can't make you drink. It requires you to do something as well. You need to independently pick up a book it will increase your vocabulary and it will help you to be able to stand up here and say something that is halfway articulate. So there has to be responsibility for ourselves, the youth themselves, and there also has to be responsibility for adults to expect something more of our youth. You mentioned, you mentioned, the, you mentioned the black church and you asked me to say something. Here it is, two words, amen. Next question. <laughs> Quickly, I want to say something about the, the impact of hunger. My senior year in, in college, my roommate says, you don't remember me, but you're the reason why I'm here. Turns out one day when I was throwing out bread from the back of my father's store, he and his little brother were going through the garbage. Mm. Okay, and I said, look, y'all don't have to do that. I've, I'll give it to you. It's day old bread anyway, so it doesn't make a difference. And just long story short, this boy was all American in football. Okay, he was afraid to even try out. 
he told me he was going to the Army where he could get three square meals a day. Now, that's football, but he could have just easily been the guy who could have discovered a cure for cancer. That's right. But he wasn't going to graduate school because he was worried about being hungry. So impact with one of these children goes 20, 30, 40 years down the road. We don't know what we're turning off by letting these folk go home. And the church said? Amen. Amen. We want to thank Yolanda. We want to thank Peggy. We want to thank Harry. Please thank them all for being here, particularly and especially the AARP. Right quick. Yeah, Yolanda. Right quick. Um, you know AARP is legendary for knowing who's turning 50 and when, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got two more years. Yolanda. Word on the street is you're close, so I'm here to give you your personal welcome home to AARP. <laughs> thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. And thank you all. Give yourself some love, please. <laughs> Dr. and I. Thank you, Sister Monica McCoy. Monica, thank you very much. Let me, matter of fact, let me just read. Yeah. One second, I'll take all that. Let, let, let me just, um, yeah. one second, one second, one second, one second. Before we wrap here, there are a lot of people I want to thank right quick. First of all, all of our guests, as I've already said, but particularly and especially uh, Monica McCoy uh, and all the AKA sisters. Let's give them some love, every one of them for inviting us, for inviting us, for making this possible. Uh, and most importantly, I want to thank you. Um, this has been a three-hour conversation, and we've done this all across the country in countless cities now. But when people show up, and they sit, and they listen, and they intake, and they digest, and they leave, and they marinate, and then they witness, and then they work, that means something. So when Doc and I show up to talk about an issue like poverty, we, we didn't come to sing or dance. It's not an athletic contest. We didn't know who was going to be here. But the fact that you all came in and packed this place out and sat for three hours to take this Absolutely. in makes us hopeful. Your presence here today is what makes us hopeful. And last but not least, Doc, um, he's done a lot of work behind the scenes, and we're the guys whose names are on the show, and we're the guys who uh, get all the attention. But our producer, uh, Joe Zephyrin, has done a wonderful job all across the country. Yeah. Please thank Jay-Z. Yeah. Yes, we have. And one last point. Yeah. One last point. To be able to spend four days on the road with my dear brother Tavis Smiley in a culture that is obsessed with cheap pleasure, don't miss the deep joys. And both of us come from a tradition that says, he or she is greatest among you will be your servant. The quality of your love for others, the quality of your service for the least of these, and we have such joy in working together and doing that. And we want all young people, all young folk, to get beyond your cheap pleasures and get into the deeper joys of learning how to love folk. We love you. Thank you very much love for coming. Love y'all. Love y'all. The band, take it away. Yeah.